Thank you, Council Member Blumenfield and Council Member Englander, in that order. Are you here first? Okay. <laughs> and welcome to the Plum Holiday Party. There's festive hats in the back, some punch and some cookies. I hope you were able to have some. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So with that, we will start off with uh, the consent items. And we have item number two, the value capture item <clears throat> on consent without objection. Item number four. Historic monument designation for a residence at Briar Drive on consent. Item four, without objection. Item five. <clears throat> we have one card. So we'll take that off consent. And item six, we will continue to January 16th. Item eight, we will continue to a date uncertain. Both those items with no objections. So going back to item number five, you could call that to order, please. We don't need a presentation. We'll just take the public comment. But uh, Mr. Mejia, if you could call that to order, please. On item five, Councilman? Yes. I saw that was, did you approve that on consent? So no, I did not. We did had not? one comment card, okay. so I took it off consent. C Councilman, item five is a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of the village court as a historic cultural monument. Okay. Carl Peter Ripaldi. Yes, sir. You could come up to the microphone and speak. You have one minute. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you're actually the applicant. Okay, you have five minutes. I'm sorry, if you could speak into the mic. We, we can't sure. hear you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm representing Hollywood Heritage today, the uh, Preservation Committee. Okay. And I just wanted to um, render my support for the designation of these, this apartment complex on Formosa as a cultural historic monument. It's a uh, whimsical and unique and a very currently uh, threatened and endangered architectural type here within our city. And I think it deserves support and designation as a cultural historic monument. Great. Thank you. We will so note that. Uh, thank you very much. So we will move to approve the item. Any objections? Seeing no objections, so ordered. Thank you. Item number one, a direct, uh, the uh, report from Dr from uh, our planning director, Vince Bertoni, and then we will go into the multiple item com comment cards. Sure, uh, sure. thank you, uh, Chair Weezar, and members of the committee. Vince Bertoni, director of planning. The one thing I'd just like to bring to your attention is this week our city planning commission will, will be meeting on Thursday morning, and they'll be considering uh, two proposed ordinances. One is regarding permanent supportive housing to to help streamline and facilitate that process in the city, and the other is an interim motel conversion ordinance, which would allow existing motels be converted on an interim basis to help uh, provide temporary housing for homeless individuals. Um, both those items have gone out for um, public hearing, um, have had public hearings, have had, had um, we've done some public outreach on that. We'll be bringing it to the city planning commission this week. Um, if they act on it this Thursday, then that will be transmitted to the council by the end of this year, and you'll be hearing it sometime early next year. Um, that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Seeing no questions, we will uh, receive and file this item. And for the record, we've been joined by Council Member Price from the Great Ninth, the New Ninth, the Great New Ninth. Uh, now going to multiple item comment cards. Patricia McAllister to speak on item two and eight. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm concerned about item eight here. Um, 
this hotel that they want to build uh, or convert to a hotel, 200 guest rooms, full line of alcohol. Um, in this area also, right over here on Olympic, as you know, uh, your governor approved child prostitution in the state of California. So this area Olympic where we have a lot of illegal alien children who are prostituting, uh, they would be able to use this hotel. Everything's right there for them. I don't think we need a hotel like that in that area because uh, they're very poor. 80% uh, of the children in the schools here at Los Angeles Unified School District are the children of illegal aliens. 70% are Latino and 10% are Asian. So I don't think we need that hotel over there. It will be uh, a great attraction for tourists though. Number two, um, here, you, this seems like to me you want to take this affordable housing and expand it so people can cram in more illegal aliens. I don't like this, number two. As you know, recently we had a burning, a house burned down here, uh, and uh, 31 illegal aliens were in the house. A couple of them were injured, okay? So they pulled out 31 illegal aliens in one house. We don't need that, okay? It's, it's dangerous to have that many people in a house, and we don't need to expand. We need to build affordable housing. HUD penalized the Los Angeles government, you guys, because you didn't spend the HUD money. You're not spending money. You're not building affordable housing. What you're doing, you're building these skyscrapers. You're giving approval for that. You've got this condominium selling for $600,000 right off 7th Street here in, uh, off uh, Figueroa. It's just ridiculous. You're not building affordable housing. You guys are the... Um, concerned with this, the land management and planning. I know you have the plan for the next 20 years in this city. I want to know what that plan is. I'm sure there's not a lot of affordable housing in it. Thank you. Good timing, too. Our next item is item number seven. Okay. Uh, item seven, Councilman, this is an appeal by Jean uh, Dorlek. Uh, this is a CEQA appeal relative to the construction of a two-story, 2,990 single family dwelling and an attached garage located in Council District 4. Thank you. Welcome to our staff who will give a brief presentation. Some new faces here, I think. Please introduce yourselves. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Hewen with the Department of City Planning. Okay, welcome. Um, Courtney Shelmold, City Planning. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, we are here today to provide recommendations regarding um, the item before you, which is an appeal of the environmental clearance for um, a project located and proposed at 6825 Mulholland Drive. The proposed single-family residence uh, is within the Mulholland Scenic Parkway specific plan and went before the Design Review Board on two occasions with changes uh, incorporated uh, to mitigate the project's impact on the corridor in the design review process. Uh, just a very brief timeline, the Director of Planning issued the original determination letter conditionally approving the project on January 24th of this year, 2017. The project was then appealed to the South Valley Area Planning Commission on February 8th, 2017. Um, then at the meeting of the South Valley Area Planning Commission on April 27th, um, the commission voted to deny the appeal, uh, which this appeal, um, the South Valley Area Planning Commission was the uh, same appellant before you today. Uh, they voted to deny the appeal, including the appellant's appeal points related to the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and uh, um, now, uh, roughly, over um, in general, the uh, same CEQA uh, uh, points or uh, contentions of the same appellant are before you today. Um, very, very briefly, in general, the appellant's concerns regarding the project CEQA review um, are similar, again, to the original uh, appeal. Uh, and in short, uh, the appellant believes that the approval of the single-family residence cannot utilize the categorical exemption because an exception to the exemption applies. Um, uh, in staff's review, after review of the whole of the record, the Department of City Planning uh, determined in approving the project that the project could utilize this categorical exemption and that the project did not qualify for any of the exceptions to the exemption. Um, the appellant specifically contends that several of the project components constitute unusual circumstances, which is one of the exceptions to the exemption. Um, however, um, 
these uh, uh, contentions do not for the reasons originally specified in the uh, South Area, Area Planning Commission response. Um, we staff can elaborate on any of those issues or points if necessary. Uh, just in conclusion, after consideration of the appeal, the Department of City Planning uh, uh, still recommends that the City Council deny the appeal and sustain the entire determination of the Director of Planning, including the environmental clearance. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Anything to add? Nope. Okay. Thank you. We will now go to the uh, appellant. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, Julia Duncan from Council District 4, you wish to speak now or after the uh, public comment? Uh, after public Okay. Dean Walroth, the appellant. Welcome, sir. You have five minutes. And can the can you the person in the middle seat of the table? Can you move slightly to the right or to the left so I could see the clock behind you? Yeah, uh, no, the time. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, honorable council members, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this um, presentation of our appeal. I'm Dean Walrath, an attorney representing Jean-Pierre Dorleac, who lives. In a, who owns a house next to the, the proposed project site. Um, the planning staff correctly summarized our appeal. Ge generally, CEQA requires a, an agency like the city to do an analysis of potentially significant environmental effects of projects that it approves. There is a provision for exemptions from the whole process um, and those exemptions are set by the um, by, by state authorities. The, the idea is that, generally speaking, projects that fit within these exemptions will not have significant environmental effects. So the exemption uh, that the city wishes to apply, in this case, um, we think wrongly, is the single-family home exemption. The, the idea is Generally speaking, a single-family home will not have significant environmental effects. But there are, in the law, a couple exceptions to the exemption, and or actually these apply to all exemptions, and one of them is for quote-unquote unusual circumstances. That sounds typically lawyerly vague. But the idea is that when there's something unusual about this specific piece of um, about this specific project that takes it out of the reasons for which the exemption was originally approved. You know, something that's unusual in this case for a single family house that indicates that it's more likely than the normal case to have significant environmental effects. That exception to the exemption means you can't use the exemption. So let me review briefly the geography of this particular site. Our, our contention is that because this house site is at the junction of really important and heavily used wildlife corridors, oh, thank you. We're, we're not saying that nothing should be built there. We're saying that the, the CEQA process should be followed. There should be an MND or an EIR for this house because it, it's going to have a big impact on wildlife. So if you are sitting at this home site, about a mile to the northeast, you have to go through some undeveloped land past Hollywood Reservoir, you get to Griffith Park. To the northwest and southeast are big parcels of land, open space owned by MRCA. There is a corridor, this, this house is on Mulholland Drive, and there's a corridor following that that's I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet wide, that's kind of like open space. It's, it's city owned and kept clear. And then there's also, going right immediately south of the parcel, a DWP easement for power lines that's also kind of kept clear. My client, Monsieur Dordiac, has um, a lot of experience with big cats, and he's, he's owned a bunch of them, and he's seen mountain lion prints on his property, on the house right next to this, this site. He's also seen um, deer, foxes, red squirrels, quail, pheasants, mallard ducks, ground squirrels. So there is, and then if you look at our exhibits, um, exhibit two shows where those parcels are that I was talking about. 
Um, and exhibit three is a map from MRCA, <laughs> AKA the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, showing wildlife corridors that go right through the property. So all we're asking really is that the city uh, not use a categorical exemption from this thing. We, we think they're prohibited from doing that under the law. Um, we're requesting instead that the city require the developer to prepare an MND or an EIR because of the wildlife has the, the project's effects on wildlife traveling through the site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will now hear from the applicant. We have two cards submitted as the applicant. The applicant rep and the applicant, Michael Gazax and Tara Harrison. As you know, we have uh, five minutes for the applicant. Would, would uh, Tara want to take the one minute after you? Is that the situation? We will keep it short. Council okay, members. thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Welcome. Members. Michael Gonzalez, apologize for the writing. Um, we, we understand the, the appeal is based on a simple narrow point that if a mountain lion may have crossed the property at some point, may have. Uh, we have submitted a biological report that shows this property is not critical wildlife uh, habitat and therefore is not an unusual circumstance. It's a very typical property for the area. Uh, with that, the, the appellant has submitted no other evidence to support their claims and there is evidence in the record before this council uh, to support staff's conclusion that a categorical exemption was appropriately issued. Thank you. Thank you. Tara Harrison. Hi, my name is Tara Harrison. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself and say that uh, I'm the homeowner at 6825 Mulholland Drive. And um, me and my husband have put our entire nest egg into this project to build a home for our family to live in. Um, we're not developers, we're just regular people. And, um, and from day one, uh, my neighbor, John Pierre, has run out and told, came out and told me to get off his property even though he's standing on our property. And, and I think he just doesn't want us to build this house. And so that's why they're doing this sequex thing. And it's been really hard for me, but I just want to introduce myself and say hi. Thanks. Thank you. Julia Duncan from Council District 4. Good afternoon, Council Members Julia Duncan, Council Member Rue's office. Um, the appellant states the use of the categorical exemption for the project is not appropriate because wildlife may have traversed on or near the project site. However, there's been no evidence offered for this. Uh, the appellants also allege that uh, regionally significant wildlife corridors come together on the property. However, MRCA has not opposed this project at any level. The project um, applicant has also gone to the extent of hiring a biologist to conduct an additional evaluation of her property as a potential wildlife corridor and concluded that the property is not integral to wildlife movement. However, as part of the original project approval and to address any and all concerns related to wildlife mobility, the project applicant was required as part of the uh, Mahalan Design Review Board process to reach an agreement with MRCA. The project applicant and MRCA have agreed to a conservation easement for the property. Um, there are no unusual circumstances uh, that would make this not a categorical exemption um, as a single family home and we respectfully request that you deny the appeal. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? On this item, again, to our planning staff, you feel comfortable, to our staff, you feel comfortable that the categorical exemption was appropriate here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, the recommendation from staff and uh, concurrence of the local council office will move to deny the appeal. Any objection to that motion? See none, so ordered. Thank you. Item number nine. Item 9, Councilman, this is an appeal by Friends of Kite Hill. This is a haul route appeal for the property at 2334 through 2354 North Lake Shore Drive in CD13. Welcome, the staff here. Building and Safety. Thank yeah. you. This project was heard and approved by the Building and Safety Commission on November 14th, and the categorical exemption was accepted 
for the hauling of 8,109 cubic yards. And we have representatives here from city planning to answer any questions regarding the categorical exemption. Okay. Thank you. We'll first hear from the appellant. I understand the appellant has um, uh, Tom Ivy, Jeb Ryhouse, Ross Pleasant. You want to take these three individuals a total of five minutes, right? And then we have a Jamie Hall who wants to take one minute as their rep. Or how do you want to do this? Um, I, I'm the uh, the appellant's uh, okay. legal representative, so I, I suggest I go first. Okay, sounds okay, good. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jamie Hall. I'm a land use and environmental attorney with uh, Channel Law Group, and I'm here on behalf of the Friends of Kite Hill, um, an organization that was founded um, to try to defend uh, Kite Hill, a completely undeveloped um, hillside property um, in the Los Angeles community. Um, I want to, obviously, our, one of our major points here is the environmental determination. So the city has issued a categorical exemption for a four home development projects. This is four single family homes on in a hillside area. So you can't use the class three exemption that we just heard about, because that only applies for three or fewer properties. So they didn't use that one. They used what's called a Class 32 infill exemption. Now, in order to fit into the Class 32 infill in exemption, you have to fit into, you have to meet certain requirements, and you have to fit into the box just perfectly. And if you don't fit in that box, you have to do a mitigated negative declaration. And as I mentioned in the um, appeal letter, the reason why this particular project, there's a couple of reasons why this project doesn't fit into the Class 32 categorical exemption box. But one of the things that you should be aware of is that you have to, this is what the code says, the project site has no value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. Not less than significant, it says no value for threat, for ha as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. So. The actual justification letter specifically notes that there are Southern California black walnut trees on this project site, two of which are proposed to be removed. And in the appeal justification letter, I show an actual screenshot showing that the Southern California black walnut tree is a threatened species. It's threatened. This is, a, this is empirical fact. So therefore, this project cannot qualify for the Class 32 categorical exemption because it does provide habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. The mere fact that they're going to replace it at a four to one ratio is irrelevant. It doesn't fit into the box. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is that there are additional discretionary entitlements needed for this project. Lakeshore Drive is less than 20 feet in width. So if you're in a hillside community and your road's less than 20 feet in width, you have to get, get what's called a zoning administrator's determination, a ZAD. You have to go to a zoning administrator and you have to either um, explain why you should get a, a deviation from the code because of hardship or you have to widen um, the street. So the problem here is that the city's GIS system, Navigate LA, shows that this project, that this street is standard width. But it, Navigate LA, it's not 100% perfect. It might get 95% there, but there's errors. And we've shown, again, through actual, we actually had a, took a tape measure and we measured the road. It's about 18 and a half feet. That's not 20 feet. And the reason why this ties into the environmental issue is that if there's, this was not analyzed at all in the environmental determination. There was no analysis of the substandard nature of the road. Um, and, uh, and you need an additional discretionary approval. So this would be piecemealing if you approved it right now because you didn't look at this. Um, and the other thing you should know, and, and I know this because I'm the president of my neighborhood association, the Laurel Canyon Association, I know for a fact that the city has routinely done environmental reviews on these really fragile substandard hillside streets because of the hazard that can be caused by constructing projects like this on streets that are so narrow. Um, and the other thing I want to mention here is that the NOE is inaccurate because it specifically says in order to qualify, the site must be adequately served by all required utilities and public services. The problem here is that the NOE specifically said that 
this project will be adequately served by all required utilities and public services as the site is currently developed. That's not right. It's not developed at all. There's nothing there. So we have errors in this document right here. It doesn't disclose the fact that they, that it erroneously concludes that the project is developed and it's not. Uh, the Southern California black walnut is a threatened species. And additionally, there's a ZAD that's required. So I would urge you to send this back so that the required environmental review can be conducted. You don't have to reach a determination about whether or not you support a four-home project there. All you have to do is conclude that this is too risky right now for the city to approve this without the required environmental review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and so we have the other appellants, uh, Tom Ivey, Jeb Breihaus, and Ross Pleasant. Each have one minute. I'm Tom Ivey. I'm a property owner nearby this project. You know, there's been many pro problems with this project. Uh, lack of notice to the neighborhood, lack of engagement with the community. But I'd like to focus on two things. One is the fact that one of the reasons why we moved here because it's really a unique uh, wildlife sanctuary within the urban landscape. Um, as, as mentioned in the black walnut, we've got our coyotes, our skunks. They may, they may not sound that enjoyable, but they're an important part of our lives. Um, and the other main issue is the substandard street. This street is very narrow. The neighbors, many houses don't have garages. They park along this street. You cannot have two cars going in opposite directions on this street. Just this today, we saw the mailman driving up. He had to back down in parallel park in order to let another car come through. And this is, and the, it's gonna be a big impact on the neighborhood, especially with 800 trucks hauling 8,000 cubic yards. Of thank you, sir. What was your name again? Tom Ivey, I-V-E-Y. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, you're, you are an appellant of record, correct? You submitted an appeal or no? I put in a card. You, okay. Uh, Councilman, he asked to your question whether he filed an appeal. He did not. Okay, who, who's the appellant of record? The, the appellant of record, Councilman, is, um, let me check here, uh, fr Friends of Kite Hill. Okay. And uh, the representative is Jamie Hall. Got it, got it. Which okay. is the attorney who spoke initially. Got it. Okay. Jeb and Ross, welcome. Gentlemen of the uh, committee, uh, my name is Jeb Brighouse. I live at 2240 Lakeshore, just up the hill from Kite Hill. I've been a friend of Kite Hill for 42 years, and I'm very, very, very disappointed that this project is not going to do anything good for Kite Hill. It's going to take the entirety of Kite Hill away in dump trucks. 800 and some odd dump trucks full of Kite Hill are going to leave. And then the uh, developer plans to um, uh, build essentially at street level, uh, which uh, will mean that Kite Hill is gone. And that is a very disappointing uh, prospect. Uh, Kite Hill is a habitat uh, for all kinds of uh, living things, which has already been addressed. Uh, the main point that I want to um, stress is that uh, we are the constituents of our council member, Farrell. Okay. Uh, we elected him, and he has a duty to represent us and our interests, and he is uh, uh, playing hide-and-go-to-seek. He okay, won't sir. Turn, uh, Your time is up, sir. Thank you very much. If you want to finish your sentence and, or your thought. We want to count our councilman to actively support us in okay. our effort uh, to save Kite Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wezar. Thank you very much, sir. Next is Ross. And we have Fred Gaines after this. One second. Fred Gaines, you also, also, 
the applicant, you're the applicant, I, I got you, the applicant rep, got you, okay. Ross? I've lived on this street since 1975. One of my concerns is the considerable noise from the breaking of rock, which I understand will be done extensively. The developer, Corey Wong, told me so. Back in 1990, this also happened at what's now 2240 Lakeview Avenue, which is about a mile away. The noise could be heard from across the Glendale 2 freeway and was very disruptive. It went on for several months. Also of concern is the traffic disruption. Currently, the community is um, already enduring disruption from construction at Briar Avenue and Terriot Street. People are being delayed and diverted into small residential streets. This project will also diminish the unique character of the neighborhood, which has already been compromised quite a bit from other developments in recent years. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I see a number of people lined up there. We will call you if you filled out a common card. Uh, and so we, we haven't called you yet, though. We will get to you. Yeah, when, when we call your name, you, we will, you'll come up and have an opportunity to speak. Right now, I, I want to turn to the um, uh, applicant. Fred Gaines the, is the representative. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Honorable Members, Fred Gaines of the Law Office of Gaines and Stacey on behalf of the project applicant 2450 Lakeshore Development uh, LLC. This project involves four single family homes on four existing lots that are completely by right, meet all requirements, no variances, exceptions to any code requirement. The only item before you is what is the appropriate environmental review for the whole route and what was granted by, uh, uh, what was recommended by staff and, and what was approved was a haul route based on a categorical exemption. Uh, the project meets all of the requirements of the categorical exemption. Uh, there was no, no evidence, we have a lawyer letter, but no evidence of, uh, of any uh, that it has been put into the record which would uh, go against the categorical exemption. The issue was raised with regard to the uh, walnut trees. Um, the project is subject to the city's protected tree ordinance, uh, LA Municipal Code 1221A12, which is uniformly applicable throughout the city. Uh, the city's protected tree ordinance constitutes a uniformly applicable set of standards comprising environmental, uh, 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 excuse me, comprising the regulatory environment and ensures that environmental impacts are substantially mitigated. The project will comply with this ordinance. Specifically, a tree report was prepared. Uh, there, are, uh, there were 10 protected trees in the site. Of the 10 trees, two were proposed to be removed, and the requirement is that eight be replaced. In, uh, eight be planted to replace the two, uh, consistent with the urban forestry requirements, and with uh, with that, the project will have no significant impact uh, on the protected trees. So there is no basis uh, whatsoever to uh, not issue the categorical exemption as has been issued, and that is the only issue uh, before you. We have been asked with um, a separate question with regard to parking of the employees that would be involved uh, in the development of the site, and uh, we are, uh, agree, will, are willing to agree to a condition that construction workers and individuals associated with the project shall not park on Lakeshore Avenue between Alvarado Street and Glen Oak Place and on Alvarado Street between Loma Vista Place and Whitmore Avenue between Alessandra Street and its dead end. So we would agree to, uh, to that additional condition of approval, but we ask that, um, that you find that the action that was taken was correct, that the categorical exemption is correct. You're hearing opposition to a project which is not before you. All that is before you is the environmental review of the whole route which uh, we concur with uh, staff and the decision maker has been properly done. Mr. Chairman, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be heard. We ask that you deny the appeal with that additional condition added. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Daniel Blank, Ron Seis, Chan or Chow, Ryan Hudson, welcome. Good afternoon. Um, for anyone who spent time in our neighborhood or on our street, they'll know that this project will choke a deeply congested neighborhood. 
I believe the developers have not spent enough time in our neighborhood or understand the challenges and flaws to their vision and can't think of any word to summarize their proposal other than reckless. In the six years that I've lived on the street, I've watched red-tailed hawks hunt the grounds. I've seen P-22, our famed mountain lion. I've witnessed the full spectrum of Southern California flora and fauna over the years. It is our small patch of wilderness in a densely packed neighborhood. As you know, there are plans to demolish everything you see and replace it with four multi-story units. You may be familiar with the narrow packed streets in our neighborhood, probably not, but throughout the day, every day, traffic is a careful game of chicken between cars in each direction. This path for this construction project will disrupt, disrupt traffic throughout the neighborhood from every single artery leading out to the main two, two lane road. In our meeting with developers, it's become clear that they haven't spent enough time in our neighborhood. They have no knowledge of the impact this project will have on all of us in our, our many homes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Franz, yes, either one, whoever. Good afternoon, my name is Francois Chow. Uh, I'm here uh, in support of my neighbors uh, in this appeal. Um, I've lived in the area for 25 years, and in that time, uh, there have been several attempts at developing this property, and uh, each time it has failed because of uh, environmental impact, of uh, the soil makeup, and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure why this time this permit was granted uh, when all the others uh, failed to do so. Uh, of course, I am concerned with the impact it has on the parking. As was said before, the street is very, very narrow, and uh, it is uh, surprisingly a major artery in that uh, area, so the traffic is heavy. Um, I think uh, the rest of my neighbors will, will come and speak about uh, their concerns, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Brian Hudson, Elise Ivey, Jack Rivera, and Jefferson Saylor. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. I've been an attorney for more than 30 years, and I've dealt with due process violations as a matter of daily practice in an administrative, quasi-criminal setting. I think you have a fundamental due process problem here that's dispositive of all of this. The counsel for the developers didn't mention Nobody got notice for anything except the grading and hauling permit. The grading and hauling permit was on a, a piece of paper this large on a small stake in front of about a 35-foot blank-faced abutment, which is the, the cliff side of Kite Hill. It was seen by happenstance. That's how we happened to make the last hearing. We weren't informed of anything in the first hearings. This thing was, was completely contemptuous of our community and of this city. It said to us, we don't really care if you get notice. You people don't matter. I'm an important developer with a $6 million or more project, which is going to be a million and a half a unit, and I'm here to build, and we expect the city to do exactly what they're told. And that's why they're here today, to have you do exactly what you're told. You shouldn't do it. We will litigate it, and we'll make it embarrassing and difficult for everybody that supported it. Elise Ivey, Jack Rivera, and Jefferson Saylor. Lisa Ivey from 2307 Lakeshore, homeowner. Lakeshore is this old substandard street. It wasn't built for cars and it certainly wasn't built for bulldozers. On my way here, I ran into the mail carrier and made a videotape that I was hoping to show today of him trying to negotiate his way up our street. And the number of times that he had to go in reverse, our street has three hairpin turns. Forget the fact that it's even 18 feet wide. It has three hairpin turns and seeing our mail carrier trying to negotiate in reverse so an, an oncoming car could pass by. I have video of this that I would love to show you, but we are all faced with this day in and day out, dozens of times a day, dozens and dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of times a day. We, people are trying to negotiate this route. Just a couple of months ago, one of my guests had an accident on the street, a fender bender, because it's very difficult to negotiate this street. You have to see it for yourself to appreciate how a bulldozer is going to affect this. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, basically, I'm just going to reiterate what uh, my other neighbors are saying. My name is Jack Rivera. I live at 2242 Lakeshore Drive. 
Um, just the, the sheer fact that they're going to, they, they claim they're going to be there for about three months removing the, uh, the hillside. Uh, that alone is just going to disrupt the neighborhood immensely, and I guarantee it is not going to be three months. It'll probably be at least six months uh, of these trucks going in and out of that corner. Uh, it's a terrible place to, to put that kind of a structure. I could probably understand one large family dwelling, one large home, but uh, having four individual homes up there with four driveways shooting out to the street, I don't even know where these guys are going to turn around. And as you've heard my neighbors go on, the traffic is just horrible. It's a game of chicken. Every time you go down for a bottle of milk or a pack of cigarettes, chances are you're going to have some jerk Uber driver shooting up there who's never been in the neighborhood. It's going to be a complete disaster. And the people who wind up moving in there are probably not going to be very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Jefferson, Allison Pleasant, John McDuffie, Richard de la Ve de la Viaga. Welcome. Thank you, Jefferson Saylor. Uh, I'm just another concerned citizen. I live directly across, uh, probably in the most impacted house by the proposed construction and haul route. Uh, we sit across from Kite Hill. There's no question that it serves in the neighborhood as essentially a park. There's not a day that goes by that somebody isn't up there with their dog or their family taking photos. Um, and the traffic concerns are very real. I think one thing that maybe not ha that has not been explained perfectly well is that this is happening relatively close to the bottom of the hill. And there's about a half mile serpentine route down that hill. And so it serves as a choke point. And when there's difficulty loading the dumps, as there certainly will be, down at the bottom, cars will be lined up for 20 in a row, and the only way to go back is to back up a what's really a one-way road. So we did meet with the developers, and we asked them to address this, but they haven't done it so far, and we'd really like uh, some of these things addressed and explicitly put in the plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Allison Plessett, 2242 Lakeshore Avenue. Um, there has been no notice given to the neighbors on this project. A waiver from CEQA was given to the developer with no notice, hearings, nor input from the citizens. There was no notice given regarding the hall route hearings. I came across a small sign posted on Kite Hill and spread the word. Even the developer, Kerry Wong, has stated that we haven't done a good job of giving notice. We are being denied our due process. The safety of our neighbors is at risk. The removal of that much earth with all these homes, which are right above the site, the, help, the hill being held up by 10-foot retaining walls. I have seen the sandstone and clay hills slide. In 1979, the area was declared a federal natural disaster area due to mudslides. The hills have slid after a small amount of grading and rain. We need to have full reports completed to assure the safety of our neighbors. We have asked the developer for copies of the soil reports he has refused, saying that we could use them against him in the development, showing that this plan is unsound. John McDuffie, Richard, and Shauna Bendinelli. Hi, John McDuffie, owner and occupant of 2317 Lakeshore Avenue. Um, I live almost directly across the street from the lots in question. Thank you for hearing my comments, uh, which address the aesthetic impact of the proposed development on the immediate neighborhood. I concur with uh, my uh, fellow neighbors' comments about the traffic. I also want to say the stretch of Lakeshore Avenue between Sierra Gorda and Whitmore has a very rustic and secluded character. It has much more resemblance to areas like Topanga Canyon than to the area of Echo Park south of Sierra Gorda. Most of the residences are small single-story cottages that date back many decades, some to the early years of the 20th century. We in the neighborhood have been provided no information about the proposed development. However, I have every reason to believe that it will have a dramatic and irreversible impact on the immediate surrounding area. I expect due to economics of real estate and the amount of earth to be removed that the proposed residences will be very large. This combined with the likely alteration of the terrain on the proposed site will cause detrimental changes in the character and aesthetics of the immediate area, which is impossible to ignore. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Can I ask for some photos? I don't know if the clerk can help me pass these around. Sure, they could. Okay. 
Okay. You're Richard? Yes, I'm Richard DeLaviaga. I'm owner. I live at uh, 2232 Lakeshore Avenue, and these are some photos of me measuring the street. Uh, you see a watercolor that Dan, who already spoke, did of the hawks. He's got video of that as well. Uh, there's some hawks on top of a light pole. Those are red-tailed hawks. Uh, my wife and I saw them yesterday. Uh, this is a drawing that I did for our little organization that we've started. Even though we got zero notice from anyone about this, we all told each other, and that's why we're all here in force, because we're appalled. Here's my sign-up sheet that's covered with names and phone numbers. Here's the CEQA checklist that was supposed to be looked at. It violates all of these, every single one. You know, I think of uh, mountaintop removal strip mining. This is hill removal development. They're going to take it all away. 8,109 cubic yards and replace it with cement. It's going to fall down into the street. The street is substandard. It's 17, uh, 16 feet in some places, 17 in others, 18 directly across from the development. This uh, is just an abdication of duty, and you know, I have comments to enter in the written record too. Uh, please do your job. Shauna Bendinelli. Alvarado Street, directly across from the proposed development site. If you could speak into the microphone, please raise it a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I live directly across the street from the proposed development site. Um, I echo my neighbor's concerns, uh, particularly the traffic safety concerns um, and the due process concerns. I was one of, to my knowledge, two people that attended the first hearing. Uh, as you can see, our neighborhood is very, very strongly opposed and has very strong feelings on this issue, so it goes to show how poor the notice was. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Is there someone here from Council District 13? Welcome. Thank you very much. Council District 13 um, is very concerned, obviously, about the um, inconvenience caused to the neighbors for the construction of this project and would like to uh, re request that additional condition be added to um, the list that was provided by the Bureau of Street Services. And that would be particularly that there be no workers, construction workers, or people associated with the project to be able to. Um, Sorry, um, being able to park on um, Lakeshore, Whitmore, and um, Alvarado. And we can provide a list, a detailed list of those streets um, as far as um, to the office. But the idea was designed to minimize inconveniences. Thank you. Great, thank you. So your recommendation is that we add additional conditions to this? Yes. That one condition? Okay. About the parking. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, to the staff, um, on the categorical exemption, um, one of the, the uh, appellants stated that this would require further analysis. Why wouldn't this require a negative mitigated de deck? Good afternoon, this is Blake Lamb with the Department of City Planning. Um, I do have a couple of comments. So the city has found that there are no exceptions to the use of the Class 32 categorical exemption, that the project meets all five criteria for the Class 32 um, categorical exemption. We've reviewed the appeal, and the purported substandard road does not preclude the city's use of Class 32. Um, additionally, the purported substandard road status and the potential need for a zoning administrator's determination, which is in the appeal and was also mentioned in the comments today, does not change the project as proposed, described, and analyzed in the categorical exemption. Uh, additionally, the project will comply with all state, regional, and local laws as regulatory compliance uh, measures. Okay, and uh, there was some mention about walnut trees, uh, and those are being replaced as required by city law? That, that's correct. There are current uh, regulatory compliance measures that would address the removal of any protracted, protracted trees. 
Okay, there was also a claim of piecemealing. It, 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 do you believe this is piecemealing? Uh, Blake Lamb with planning. So there is no requirement that the applicant um, uh, file for any um, entitlements at this time. Um, if there is a future potential need for a zoning administrator's determination to address the purported substandard road, then that would be an application um, that would be required by the city. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Given the department's recommendation and Council District 13's recommendation, we move to deny the appeal and include language which states parking by construction workers and individuals associated with a project shall not park on Lakeshore Avenue between Alvarado Street and Oak Glen Place and on Alvarado Street between Loma Vista Place and Whitmore Avenue between Alessandro Street and its dead end. And what's before us is uh, the actual hall route, not the project itself. So we are just examining the hall route here and the mitigations we are putting in are for the hall route, right? That's what's before us in our only purview, so. Okay, thank you. Any objections to that motion? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Okay, item number three. Item three, Councilman. Uh, this uh, item contains various reports, contains a report from the city planning department uh, relative to the proposed sign ordinance and also a department of building and safety report uh, as to a request of additional staffing. In addition, there is a communication from the CLA. Um, as you requested back in May of this year, uh, you asked for a financial analysis of the issue of um, off-site digital signage on uh, public property and on, pri on private property. The CLA contracted with the firm of Navigant Consulting. They are here to prepare, to present their findings. Uh, the firm has extensive experience with the city in conducting financial analysis and um, the individuals who prepare that analysis are here uh, to make a presentation. Right. Thank you. Is planning uh, is staff here to present this item? Good afternoon, <coughs> Good afternoon, Council members. Uh, Tom Rothman from the Department of City Planning. I'm joined by uh, Phyllis Davidson, Senior Planner. And uh, we are here today to present an interim draft of the citywide sign ordinance. Uh, the updates in this version of the ordinance primarily relate to off-site signs and on-site digital signs. So as part of the background, we want to say that this has been a um, part of the planning department's work program for about a decade now and it was originally approved by the city planning commission in 2009 we've been on the plum agenda for about 20 plus times most of those times have been report backs though so we are very happy to bring an ordinance to you um, and other departments have brought, are bringing reports to you today this ordinance or our version of this ordinance did uh, return to the city planning commission in 2015 where they rejected digital signs and off-site signs outside of sign districts. And the city attorney had prepared that ordinance in a further ordinance in 2016, which we've revised for your presentation today. Um, good afternoon, Phyllis Nathanson with the Department of City Planning. Uh, on May 31st, uh, your committee directed the planning department to revise the 2016 city attorney's ordinance with specific instructions for off-site signs, including the so-called Berry Blue mural signs and on-site digital signs. Uh, and you also uh, requested that we report back on the status of the environmental, environmental review on the project and that we prepare a billboard blight reduction policy document. Uh, the ordinance um, before you today uh, preserves the ban on off-site signs with exceptions for sign districts and relocation agreements per your request. It also allows on-site digital signs with limitations 
and permits um, the so-called very blue mural signs to change copy using materials other than paint. Uh, with regard to the CEQA status, uh, staff is preparing a draft initial study and the study will inform the department's future report on the environment, environmental review. And uh, regarding the billboard blight reduction policy document, uh, the department is working with the office of the administrative officer to prepare the document uh, requested by Plum. Uh, this draft before you is an inter interim release uh, for discussion. Staff uh, will continue to evaluate and refine the draft and work with the Department of Building and Safety and the city attorney. Thank you. Well, thank you for all your work and indeed we have been at this at some time. I, I, we thought we were on a path a few years ago and that got kind of uh, thwarted, but now here we are again and I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, on the ordinance that's before us, on the updated or draft ordinance, um, what revisions are there or any significant revisions from the previous versions or previous discussions so we could just pull those out? anything significant of well, change? The revisions are um, having to do with relocation agreements. There's a process for relocation agreements and uh, limitations for on-site digital signs. Okay. But in terms of um, how the department um, varied from the instructions, uh, we did use our discretion on uh, several items. Mm -hmm. um, so one of those items is that we um, added to the ordinance a prohibition uh, on relocating a sign into an established sign district. And we did that to preempt an applicant from attempting to circumvent the sign district provisions. And we also um, added um, a time to act for the director to submit a report to the city council. That time to act was 90 day, is 90 days. And we drafted appropriate findings for the decision maker, which in this case is the city council. And we attempted to allow an appropriate amount of discretion. And in terms of digital displays, uh, we applied the limit of 300 candelas per square meter at night to all digital displays, not just for the on-site uh, digital signs. Uh, to retain regulatory consistency, and this resulted in reducing the brightness of off-site digital signs from 450 candelas per square meter at night to the 300 candelas. And we also removed the fading transition option, so all digital signs would, uh, must, would be required to use an instant transition between messages. Uh, we found, we determined that that would be less distracting. Okay. And, of course, there were some uh, technical uh, modifications as well. Okay. And have you determined a process uh, by which new relocation agreement applications will be submitted and received by the department? That is still in development. We hope to include that in our policy document that we'll submit at a later date. Okay. And, and yeah, we requested the, the policy document. Um, so that'll come at some future unknown time. Okay. And how about the CEQA clearance? Um, what CEQA clearance will be required for these, this ordinance? We are just finalizing our initial study, so we haven't come to a, um, a, fi a final decision yet, but we have done considerable work on a new initial study for this project, but we haven't come to the determination of what actual clearance will be necessary. Okay, and we anticipated we'll bring that, that back when we bring back the um, the policy document. Yeah, and the premise of that CEQA clearance, I mean, we are anticipating a uh, net reduction of signs. So I don't know if that might be taken into consideration in terms of environmental impacts. So we are actually hoping there's the proposed digital that happens, and then there's a proposed net reduction of signs. So, but I think the net reduction of signs, which is a main goal of this ordinance not lost in the analysis from the sequent analysis. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions for planning? We will also bring up uh, CLA and their consultant and the Department of Building and Safety and ask them questions as well. Should, okay, Mr.
Mr. Bloomfield. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I realize this debate on science has been going on for a long time, and as a, as a new committee member, um, I'm just kind of wading into it, and I am by no means an expert. Uh, the, the chair and the committee uh, and departments have put out a lot of good options, but I tell you, I'm, I'm still a little uncomfortable with the ordinance. I want to explain why and ask a question about it. The, the main issue is the <laughs> permissiveness of relocation agreements um, could be contrary to what folks in my district want or desire. Um, I get it, the desire for sign reduction program, for a reduction program is very real and worthy, um, as is the desire for new revenue streams. But the visual blight potential is also very real and concerning. So one thought is just putting out there, you know, a more tailored or limited scope for this program may be the best way to start implementing a pilot program on publicly uh, owned land seems like a possible way to start, which we, people have been talking about, or allowing relocation agreements in, uh, to vary in districts or in limited areas, um, or some type of cap um, so that it doesn't proliferate and replace you know, down the road. But the biggest issue is this issue of discretion, and you, you, I wanted to ask you about it, because that's the thing that gives me the most concern, is um, in the relocation agreement, there's a certain amount, and you use the word appropriate discretion. And if it were, if I felt like it was more arbitrary and capricious, and that, that, that as a council, and as a council member, that we would be able to to make the choice if, if the community really didn't like something, that we'd be able to, to make the choice where they do like it and where they don't like it, I'd be much more comfortable. But what I'm worried about is this word of appropriate uh, is a limitation and um, potential lawsuits to boot. Uh, and that I know it has to be, you know, fit in with the community to some extent, but, but help me understand or, or give me more comfort of of what that, how that discretionary process works and, um, you know, and what kind of control as a council member I would have to prevent a digital billboard or a billboard going up uh, in, the, in my community if, if I knew the community didn't want it there, even if it met, checked off the boxes. So there are um, free speech uh, rules that we have to abide by and signs uh, definitely fall into that category. I'm probably not the best person to speak about this. Their city attorney here, if um, they want to speak to it, but we've been very careful not to include um, findings that provide unfettered discretion to the decision maker because uh, it could be considered uh, an intrusion into free speech. So we've tried to balance um, allowing as much discretion as we thought we could without running into difficulties. And I, and I understand the need to, certainly on content, that we shouldn't be deciding something based on content, but in terms of time, place, and manner, and you know, if, if people don't want to see a, a billboard on a particular location, regardless of what the message is, um, we still have to come up with certain findings. It's not just discretionary at that point. Is that correct? Yeah, let me, let me as uh, Ken Fong from City Attorney's Office, let me elaborate a little bit on that. When, when you're talking about time place, and, time, place, and manner, usually those are set criteria. So for example, uh, you can have a set of sign regulations that say that all signs have to be 10 feet tall, right. or they have to be spaced 100 feet from each other. So there's absolutely no discretion there because the uh, city officials, uh, they just follow those regulations in the time, place, and manner restrictions in the sign regulations. Now what we're talking about here for relocation agreements and perhaps, uh, and for some other parts of the sign ordinance are when you have applications for approvals of signs um, sort of, uh, you can call it a permitting process for a sign or a sign uh, approval process. When, when you're going through a process like that, you have to make sure that your findings are even-handed and they're not granting 
too much discretion to a city official so that the city official uh, basically has the power to deny or approve whichever signs he or she uh, you know wants to and 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 it's not bound by discrete criteria that would prevent uh, him or her from denying free speech rights so there therein lies the problem because in some areas the community might want a much smaller sign have a much lower tolerance for uh, a particular size and another and and just down the road there may be a greater tolerance for a, a larger size but to to make that decision is fairly arbitrary because you there's not the findings that can be found and so under this under the current scheme there's no way for the decision maker or makers because it's a full council choice to to differentiate that well no that, that that's right and and you've put your finger on uh, a tension between two policy issues which makes uh, uh, so regulation of signs one of the more complex areas of land use because of course when you are when planners are looking at uh, zoning and land use and that sort of thing they want the flexibility to be able to uh, you know mix and match and put whatever uh, structures are appropriate but then on the other hand when you have signage uh, they're protected by the First Amendment so we have to put in place uh, regulations that that are consistent with the First Amendment I, I, I understand that there is that tension but but first of all we have to comply with the First Amendment and then do the best we can to allow city officials the ability to regulate signs in a way that makes sense that therein lies my, sort of my biggest concern with the, the way it's written. It's, it's kind of, it opens up a pretty large door without having that discretion. Um, you know, so that's, for me, that's where, that's where the, the biggest problem lies. So, and that's where also, if we waded into this more of a pilot style and, and did, you know, the public lands or did something more discreet, then we might be able to gain a little bit more comfort with that process uh, before it's just opened up and, and I've got a community revolt on my hands. Um, can, can I ask a question? That, and would relocation agreements uh, require council approval? Yes. Yes. They, they would? Okay. So, so the relocation agreements would come to council and there would be some say by the yes. local council member. But we okay. still wouldn't be able to, and, and I don't mean to interrupt, but just to help tease this point out because that if, and that that fact initially gave me a lot of comfort until I looked into a little bit more and realized that we couldn't just say no as a council we would have to we would have to be um, approving a series of, of findings uh, yeah. um, and those findings you know would have to match up with the with the facts of the case it wouldn't we couldn't just we couldn't just come out and say we as a council we're, we're voting no on something Right, so it's not really, we, do, yeah. we don't really have the option to just get that resolution and vote no, mm -hmm. or even to table it forever, right? Because there is a, there's a, there's a time lane, line on it that if we don't hear it, it automatically, you know, even if that was there, that would be a fail safe if I felt it could you know, table it indefinitely, but there's not that. So it's, even though it's great to have that vote, it still doesn't give us that, that level discretion, at least that I would, that would make me comfortable. Okay. Um, can I, additional question or you want no, to come that, back? No, that was, I just want to, I, I caught in in the tail end of that discussion, so I just want to make that clear. Okay, good. No, I'm fine. Go ahead. You have a few more questions, but I don't want to hide yeah. the time. And, and, and uh, so this is the planning department. We're still going to bring up the CLA and also building and safety. So any questions for them? We could, um, yeah. Well, I guess one more for the planning, I guess, specifically. The current proposal. Um, does it allow for at least one sign district in each in e uh, each at least one sign district in each council district? Or, you it know, wasn't it drawn up that way. It was just drawn up that if the properties in question uh, match the regulations, then a sign district could be established. And, and how does that get expanded? Is there what's the, the process? Can can the um, council initiate a new sign district? Um, 
is there an option to make the council the sole initiator of the sign district, or, or how would that process? An work? applicant can approve. I mean, uh, apply for a sign district, and these sign districts. Are uh, it, it sounds like there's maybe a misunderstanding of how they work. Um, they're not existing sign districts necessarily. Anybody can apply to establish a new sign district as long as the property uh, complies with the um, fundamental requirements. And if you, <clears throat> uh, the current version has two versions of a sign district. We call it Tier 1 and Tier 2. Tier 1 is the more traditional Hollywood um, the uh, sports and entertainment district, those are the larger sign districts with billboards that can face the public right of way. Those are intended and zoned currently to be allowed only in our more intensive commercial zones. So they're not, we don't have, every, every one of our council districts and community plans don't have that type of zoning. So in Chatsworth, there would not be a, an option of applying for a tier one, possibly a tier two, which is more of that internal campus setting where you could have billboards that face inward. but as far as the larger ones go, it wouldn't be, it, it, it's just a matter of our land use designations. Like there's a tier two in my district, in the Warner Center area, uh, with the inward facing, and, yeah. and but it also has a number of other protections for the community, and that, that works out well. Um, but the process of expanding the ability to, to do sign districts may be another option to some extent. But, but how does that, you're saying the applicant can apply for that, but it's still the discretion of the council? Correct. It's, a, it's, 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 it's an overlay district, and if as long as the uh, applicant um, meets the requirements, they can apply to the city to create um, a tier one sign district. As long as they're in the right type of zoning or land use designation, it's the right size, and there are findings that are met and found by the city planning commission and the city council, they can but set up a sign district. But that also works in contradiction to our ban, right? I mean, the more sign districts That's that an have. exception to the ban. Sign districts are the first exception, and then these relocation agreements would be the and, second And at exception. some point, there's a tipping point where if we have too many sign districts, it's our ban is in jeopardy, ban. or legally in jeopardy. And I, I wouldn't ask you to opine on what that number is, because I don't want to get into that, but just that there is that tension, um, which makes it a little difficult to use that tool to expand Sure. The sign districts. Well, and that's why we've been fairly conservative with where sign districts are allowed to go. There's not that many regional centers in our 470 square miles. One, one other thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop on you guys, but relocation agreements. Is there a way to create an opt-in system for community plan areas or council districts um, so that it's not everywhere but an, an opt-in? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure if that if we could make a justification for why those community plan areas would not be an acceptable place to put a sign and a digital sign and others are. I guess we could do it. I don't know what our legal requirements would be, though. Yeah, we, uh, city planning would have to look into that because you would be treating signs differently in different council districts. And in certain respects, it might make sense, but you know, I, I think it's too early for us to give a definite opinion as to how that would work. But if you can give us instructions to look into that, and we would assist planning to do that. Well, I certainly would want to add that into our instructions because I would love to know that the possibilities of opt-in or opt-out because maybe there therein lies a, a pathway for some of this. And it doesn't even have to be on the full district level. It could be, you know, smaller blocks, but, but giving folks who, people feel differently about this throughout the city, even throughout my district. Um, and that would, that would give me a little bit more comfort as well. You know, I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to hog it. I'll come back around. Okay. Um, any other questions for planning? We could also ask them after we hear from the other uh, staff, but Mr. Price. Your leadership on this issue. I know it's been a long, hard battle. <clears throat> for special thanks to staff, planning, and city attorney for, for your ongoing efforts uh, and for other departments as well. Uh, this is a really interesting, uh, interesting presentation, and the, the breakdown of possible annual revenue uh, is interesting and exciting, I think, from uh, all, all angles. Um, and being able to use GPS in ways, the GIS in ways that we haven't before. 
But I, you know, the, you, the analysis shows that uh, District 9 has the second highest uh, number of static off-site signs at 713, but the lowest number of off-site digital signs <laughs> at two uh, in the city. And uh, I, I got a question. Uh, can you speak more about the separation distance from city-owned properties, Caltrans, highways, uh, and scenic highways? The reason I ask is that uh, the 9th has two freeways, the 110 and the 10, uh, intersecting it. Um, and there, so there may be additional limitations where future digital signage can be placed. Um, so, and, and secondly, in your analysis, uh, when you looked at other cities, or maybe this is for the consultant, I think those questions, Councilman, would be more appropriate to Navigan Consulting. Okay, that's fine. Okay. okay. All righty. Any other questions right now? No. Okay. So we could hear from our CLA and uh, consultants on the report, please. Sure. Uh, and then so we will hear from Building and Safety, uh, and then we will go to uh, public comment. So, Councilman, um, as you recall, back in May, you requested a financial analysis. Uh, the CLA contracted with Navigant Consulting, and as requested by this committee, they have a series of models that they can show you, and they've also done a GIS analysis uh, specific to each of the 15 council districts in the city. Uh, they also have models and revenue projections as it relates to a public option and a private option. Um, and without any further delay, I would like to present Mr. Andrew Ray, who's uh, the principal consultant, Christina Stanford, and uh, Elizabeth um, Lee from Navigant Consulting. Thank you, Mr. Bahir, and thank you for the CLA's work on this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Weezer, Council Members. The Chief Legislative Analyst retained Navigant to conduct a policy and financial analysis of off-site digital signs. Um, we examined two off-site digital signage options requested by the Plum Committee. Um, one, the citywide option, which allows digital off-site signs on public and private property, and a public option, which allows digital off-site signs on public property only. We used a three-prong approach to model the approximate number of signs and their associated revenue. We did a peer review of 24 cities. Some cities were selected by the Plum Committee or staff. Others. Um, we thought would be of interest or relevant to the city. We looked at their relevant policies and revenue structures. We did a geographic analysis using 12 different scenarios, and to complete that, we used advanced GIF, GIS mapping um, software that allows us to get a lot of granularity on each council district, the city as a whole, and the type of properties that we're looking at. And then we did financial analysis with six different financial scenarios. The purpose of the study is to really illustrate the potential outcomes from a range of policy and deployment decisions the city might make. We, d we don't make a recommendation on one over another. We're really trying to bookend all the potential options under the proposed ordinance and under other uh, ordinance structures adopted by other cities. Regardless of which option the city chooses, obviously there are legal issues involved with all of this, so the city attorney's help is, um, as always, essential. For today, I'm going to talk about two approaches to represent the universe of available properties for off-site digital signs. In approach A, it, um, it's based on the language from the Plum Directive and aims to show the universe of digital sign placements using the best available data directly from the city and or reputable publicly available data sets um, such as the County of Los Angeles, Caltrans, Metro, etc. While the team consulted city staff to confirm the veracity of the data, the property data provided to Navigant does not have the granularity necessary to accurately reflect um, all the nuances of the city properties and the properties, uh, particularly the city properties. So those that are unlikely to be appropriate for digital signs are in the city data, and we'll talk about how we dealt with that in, in a second. Those include proprietary departments such as LA, um, DWP, police, fire, things like that. Um, the harbor, public works. Um, the restrictions in approach A, though, result in approximately 3.5% of the total eligible land in the entire city would be available for off-site digital signage. So gives you a perspective as to, under the proposed ordinances, about 3.5% would be available. In approach B, 
we applied additional filters to remove from consideration properties that Navigant and city personnel feel are unlikely to be appropriate for off-site digital signs. But again, that would include the proprietary departments, city, uh, regional city halls, administrative buildings, things like that, um, portions of the LA River. The restrictions in approach B result in approximately 2.1% of the eligible land in the entire city would be available. To provide a little bit of detail on our approach, um, we collected data from, as I mentioned, 24 North American cities, including several others in California. Um, all of the details on the cities are provided in the report or in the appendix. Um, we looked at a policy review of different approaches to off-site digital billboards, and what we found is each city has its own unique um, policy options and desires, and so it varies widely from city to city. Takeaways for Los Angeles' financial scenarios, we applied some of the financial models from other cities to our financial analysis, and um, we'll explain that as we go. And then there are eight in-depth case studies provided in the full report. For the geographic analysis, we use data from the Department of City Planning, the CAO's office, and the Department of Building and Safety, um, and we supplemented that with um, information available from public sources, um, Google Maps, et cetera. Um, the geog geographic scenarios use assumptions from the Plum Directive and the current um, sign code for zoning, residential buffers, takedown ratios, and other inputs and constraints. We used ArcGIS mapping of available areas for off-site digital signs under the scenarios. Um, and we'll talk more about the mapping software as we go. Um, we provided in the report illustrative maps with counts of off-site digital signs for each scenario. Um, we also have the models available themselves. In the financial analysis, we took data from the peer review case studies, the CAO's office and the Office of Finance. Um, we used assumption for revenue sharing percentages, fixed fees, and other potential revenue structures from your current draft <coughs> ordinance and from your peers. The revenue calculations are based on the geographic scenarios off-site digital sign results. So the geographic approach um, for approach A, the results, um, we restrict the areas as directed by the Plum Committee for residential highway and sign district buffers, um, restricted commercial land use categories and zones, industrial and public facility land use categories and zones, city and metro owned properties. Um, so the first two buffers, the 100 foot and the 200 foot buffer, for both of those, we use the 500 foot um, separation between signs. <coughs> it's uh, called for in the Plum Directive. And so signed faces, 35% of the signs approximately were assumed to be dual facing signs. Um, so for example, if I look at the single parcel category, you'll see there's 3,152 um, potential signed faces. In that case, that translates into 2,335 actual sign locations. So more sign faces, faces than sign locations. Um, we applied a, a range of potential um, uh, penetration. So you have a total potential. And then we said, you know, the city may decide to restrict those. So we chose arbitrarily 50%, 25%, and 10% what would the counts be in those things? And obviously, um, you can designate it to be 5%, 90%, whatever is appropriate. Um, to the council district category um, is really intended to be almost a test of the tolerance of a particular council district for signs. Um, council district 14 has the most signs of any district. And what, what we sought to do in the um, council district scenario is to make sure that a district with a very low tolerance for signs doesn't have more signs added just because it has the sites. So it uses a ratio of how many signs it has relative to council district 14 that would, that would basically constrain the number of new signs so that it's not unlimited. So it's a, it's a way of, a policy way of restricting signs to sort of stay at the current ratios. High traffic is based on traffic patterns. Um, high traffic areas are the most desirable for certain um, billboard advertising. And so we looked at how many of those sites are available. 
And for each of these, we do have the ability to go council district by council district. Um, So in approach B, as I mentioned, we further filtered um, the count to weed out the proprietaries, Port of LA, DWP, um, other previously un unidentified environment, environmentally sensitive sites to deal with some of the issues around um, the LA River sites and things like that. Um, we consider this to be a more realistic view, but further screening of the city's um, data is probably necessary. There are still a lot of properties that are not accurately captured as to what their true use is. So to get down to a, you know, really rigorous uh, count, um, the city's database needs to be further refined. And there's a way to do that, but it takes time. Um, so in, the, in this case, for example, the single parcel um, to total potential sign faces is reduced to 2,307 and the total number of sites would be 1,704. Um, if any of the categories need further explanation, I'm, we're happy to answer questions as we go. So moving from the citywide option to the public option, in the uh, geographic scenarios, we restricted eligible areas using residential and sign district buffers, city and metro owned property, and then all of the um, scenarios that are listed below. In this particular case, single parcel um, moves down to 1828, which is 1,354 sites. Um, the council district scenario, 760 total potential sign faces. Um, moving on from there. In option B, where we further um, filter that, the single parcel total number of sites would be 728 based on 983 um, sign faces. Council district would be 242. And as the notes say, when we apply the more rigorous screening of the city data, it results in approximately a 45% reduction in the number of signs. So moving on to the, um, the revenue analysis. So the revenue analysis is very much based on the number of available um, sign faces and then the method that you use it and the scenario. So 100 foot, 200 foot council district, high traffic or tier one. And we looked at under annual payments, a fixed in lieu payment based on the um, sign takedown ratios, a revenue sharing in lieu payment, current tax, the street furniture method, which is what you're familiar with right now. It's basically the enclosed um, bus waiting areas uh, that would have signs, and then revenue sharing, annual rent, and upfront payments. And it's worth noting that many cities use more than one um, fee arrangement. So in some cases, there's um, upfront payments and annual rent and taxes. Um, there's a combination. So. Uh, quite a few cities have not ch chosen one size fits all. Um, the revenue sharing in lieu, in lieu of payment is um, the closest to what is currently envisioned in the draft ordinance. And the, range, and the ranges are uh, in each category purely a function of the sign takedown ratios. In approach B, the numbers come down because um, the, the sign faces have been reduced by 45%. Um, and in each of these financial scenarios, we assume that you're doing 25% of the total that's available to you. Um, in the report, the 100 and the 50% scenarios are also shown. Um, so in this case, for example, um, for the... Uh, 200 foot buffer, an annual rent revenue stream uh, would be between 9.2 and 11.4 million, and then each category is represented. So what we tried to do was to portray under a large variety of payment types and under a large variety of scenarios, what would be the potential revenues. 
and these are not difficult for the city or for us to assist you in changing. As you change the filtering criteria, the mapping software is very robust, and it really lets you model in a very granular way how you can deal with different council districts scenarios and how you can really identify the actual number of sign faces in various locations that you could get. So there's a lot of flexibility going forward for the city. So in the public option, we presented the results in the same way. And it might be useful to move on to um, slide 14, which is the approach comparison. So in this particular one, we wanted to highlight sort of from beginning to end how the calculation works so that you get a, um, an idea. We took the 100-foot buffer scenario. Um, and what we did was to illustrate the differences between approach A and approach B, we used the following table to show what the results would be. So you can see um, under the 25% of potential sign faces, if we use the citywide approach um, in A, there will be 662 um, sign faces available. If we use the fixed in-lieu payment scenario, the revenues would range between 16.6 and $165.5 million. If we use the revenue share in-lieu payment, 11.3 um, to 180.7, and then the results move on um, across the board from there. So it's very much a number of sign faces, selecting the type of revenue streams that you want to have, um, and then applying whatever uh, cap. In this case, we applied a 25% cap. Future considerations for the, uh, the committee to um, review. These, these scenarios are really designed to illustrate the potential outcomes from a, a wide range of policy and deployment decisions. And for the city to be able to use a tool like this to really look at granular revenue and policy implications. Um, and this mapping technology and the financial models we developed are very robust and you can use them in a variety of ways. Um, a, real, a critical element in doing this analysis is to get more and more confident with the data. And the current data sets have a lot of errors. Um, and the city is working to upgrade that data and better maintain it. But that's one of the big critical issues in really um, developing a high degree of confidence with the analysis. And happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you very much for that uh, report. We certainly appreciate uh, the data. Um, <coughs> that's forthcoming that will allow us to make the decisions uh, to move forward with a policy. And one thing is that I think we, we need a more realistic idea of the number of city properties so we can more accurately estimate uh, future revenues. And I understand there's been some issue um, getting that a good database for, for to do that. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So in the way that the, the data is captured, in and it's not consistent. So in, in some cases, a DWP um, site will say DWP transformer station. In many cases, it's not identified as LADWP's property at all. And so because when the data was entered, it wasn't entered with specific uses. You know, more recent data is better than some of the older data. But so to really know yes, I can absolutely put a sign on this particular parcel because it truly is a public site. It's not restricted. It's not owned by a proprietary or used by a proprietary. The database doesn't accurately reflect that currently. Um, using Google Maps, using other available GIS software, that can be updated. Um, but until that's done, you know, and, and we did one filter that removed approximately 45% of the properties by digging in deeper using um, other mapping software, uh, peeling back several more layers. When you can do that to 100% of the data, then I think you'll really know our universe of sites is truly this. Um, so it's, it's doable. You know, when we first looked into it, we thought it might have to be manually done. And then we, um, digging in deeper, we found you could use other mapping technology and other um, computer programs to further screen it, update it, and then turn it back over. Any other issues with uh, data or difficulty with the data? No, that was the main issue. Um, I think 
in general, if you provide more refinements, whether it's buffers or um, things like better city property data, we're able to model that. And, and so it did impact your analysis because given your uncertainty of what actual data you were using here, it impacted your analysis and, and how so? So I think in the, in the sort of the full universe, the full universe is, is, is probably too inclusive. In other too, in, words, too inclusive. Too inclusive because it doesn't, because it didn't know that a DWP yard was a DWP yard. It looked like an available piece of public property. Mm. Um, it, it was counted, and perhaps if you'd have that data, you wouldn't have counted it. In option B, we partially resolved that issue by applying as much technology we could in a short period of time. Um, and that's why 45% of the public properties moved out. With a bit more time and a bit more effort, we could probably get that number to an even higher confidence level. Okay. So I, I think where the, the limitations of the data are now is it lets you count too much. Um, and that the more that you refine that, the number will come down. You, you narrow that, okay, right. okay. And, um, and I see that your report includes single parcel and council district among other scenarios for counting the number of possible locations. Uh, can you clarify the difference between the two scenarios again? Sure. So council district is, is really trying to do, um, we, we tried to say, is there, is there a built-in tolerance in a particular yeah. council district for digital signs? And as you go through district by district, there is a large variance. Yeah. Some districts have more, council district 14 has more, other districts have less. So we said, what if that is a, a built-in tolerance, right? Established over time, how could, how could we model that going forward. So the council district scenario really applies basically the current ratio between a district with less than council 14. Council yeah. 14 is the, the sort of uh, the base. Um, bellwether. And so we apply what that ratio to the total number of available signs so that the signs can't grow past that ratio. So it's not perfect, but it, it's a, a sort of a tolerance band. And what it is designed to do is to make sure a district, let's say, that had no signs, so there's nothing to take down for the tote down ratios, wouldn't um, have signs imposed on it because it has eligible sites. So if you have nothing to take down, then you're not going to, a site won't become eligible. It, it keeps that restriction. And the single parcel basically relaxes um, the 500 foot separator that's in the 102 foot um, scenarios and says, if I had no 500 foot scenario and I could put properties more closely together, how many of those type of properties would I have? And why was there not a single parcel scenario included in the citywide summary? Um, we provided it for this presentation mm -hmm. and... Um, okay, but not in the... In the report itself, but... Sure. Um, it's, it's in this, and this will be uploaded into the council file. Okay. And um, so what do you recommend are some of the ways we could further refine the analysis or data um, to be more consistent with what we're attempting to do here? Um, you, you started talking about that, but what do you recommend? Because we certainly, I, I got the sense that in some categories we're too expansive of what actually exists. In some other categories, it's too narrow. And so um, how do we then, what would you recommend for you to do or for us to do to, to further refine that data? What's the next steps on that? So I, I, think, I think we have the technology available to us and now the experience after having played with the, the data for a while. Um, I believe we could significantly call the total number of properties to one that would very much sort of fit the policy direction that the Plum Committee is going into. And it would probably take, it goes faster um, as you dig into it, it would take between one and two months to do. I think the other thing is to, um, and we've, we've worked with CLA, CAO, planning, and your office's staff to say what are the scenarios that are the most realistic that we've included. I think if we focus on one or two of those scenarios that you think actually make the most sense, then we'll get even more granular. 
the other thing is if there is a council by council in trust, we can show more granularity for each council district so that there's more, you can illuminate more what you could actually do or not do in a particular district. So I think those three things would make the most sense. And then you would really have, I think, a highly accurate view of, of sort of a, the city's real range of available properties and what it looks like on a district by district basis under some very specific scenarios. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Englander? Yeah, thank you very much. First, um, thank you for putting this, the data together because I think there are, it opens a lens of looking at modeling that we weren't able to do before, right? Um, so before it was a matter of um, really looking down narrow paths of policy. Are we gonna do public, are we gonna do private? What does it all mean? How many, and we didn't, it's really an un, uninformed decision. And I think it's what's taken so much of the discussion um, in getting us to this point is trying to figure that all out. What do, what do we have to work with so far in the space in terms of rules and regulations from obstacles and opportunities of what land is out there, what's available, what's not, what do we want, what don't we want, what does that mean in the space of takedown, and how does that equal out to different council districts? And I think, um, you know, Bob said it earlier, I mean, it's not one size fits all. Not every council district wants everything the same way, and yet, but the policy sort of has to be that way. Um, and, and having an equation with a baseline of, and a ceiling of, um, here are the, 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 the districts that have uh, very populated sign areas that, that have a lot of signs and coming up with that that equation to say here's how we uh, sort of neutralize it and uh, make them all equal equal makes makes a lot of sense actually and <clears throat> it's a I think it's a fascinating approach um, I think in, in looking at where the the chair was asking um, now that we have at least much better data than we had um, I won't say it's perfect, and I think there are some issues just because gathering it um, from antiquated sources, right. you're gonna have difficulties. But, um, but with that, it's certainly better than what we've ever had. We can actually look at some modeling and some scenarios and what that might mean. Um, I, for one, as an example, um, yield the least, uh, which is probably I've been more supportive, <laughs> right? Um, and I've known that because you don't have to actually count signs to drive around my district and then drive around anywhere else in the city to see. I just have the least. Now, on the flip side of that, is I, I also have some very annoying, and many of them, the very small ones, I would love to get rid of. Um, and in exchange for digital with conditions and restrictions. I also have probably the least opportunity to be able to take advantage of that um, because I don't have a lot of the public um, spaces and land. So I'd have to utilize some private to get there. And, and, and that's why coming up, I think, with some kind of hybrid of, um, of a public and private would afford us both on the revenue side, um, but also on the takedown side, which I think is equally important even though I have the least amount of impact, I still have a significant, even being the least, a significant impact um, that people really don't like in exchange for um, what's, what I would consider very palatable. Um, things that would have the conditions of illumination that you described, things that would have the opportunity for PSAs and emergency messaging, as particularly as we just came out of evacuations and the fires and knowing that those could be fully utilized for first responders and those communities, um, especially in equestrian areas and other places. So I look at that opportunity and, um, and I don't know how, what the next step would then be to model, because now we have the opportunity to model different scenarios, all right? Um, but I'd like to see, uh, when we come back, a model that also gives uh, me an opportunity to take some of those smaller boards down and put some of the digitals up, but it would have to be public and private. Um, otherwise, once again, we're not able to participate 
and, 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 and a lot of places in the valley won't be able to participate um, with that opportunity. So and, I, uh, and so that's, that's what I'd like to see is, is sort of a hybrid of both. So and, and Councilman, I think, you know, one of the things that we talked about is that as you move forward and as you're negotiating with uh, the various suppliers of digital signs, one of the things that we think that the city will now have is the ability to really look at, so what, are, what is the real revenue potential from various uses and various sites and various concentrations? Some of the cities that we looked at in the study have very limited areas. They have high saturation in a very limited area with very high fees. And they've said, we're gonna be very specific and they based it very much on traffic patterns. You know, with the programs like Waze and Google Maps, you can calculate at a very accurate level the number of cars that pass by exactly at what times of day, mm -hmm. what messages they wanna see at certain times. With the, the mapping software that we use, and some other tools, you'd have the ability to really say, in my district, what are the sites I most want to develop and why? What would that be worth to a billboard company if we were to do that? And what are the impacts uh, along the way? And so I think that's a tool you didn't have before. And I think, so, you know, technology can be great, technology can be not so great. In this particular case, um, the, the geo mapping software is really, really a very powerful tool. And if you model it with the financial models, you can do the type of things. You can say, what are the impacts of this particular policy decision? And if I wanted to restrict it, where could I restrict it and make the most amount of money for the city to offset other things? Yes, I do think you'll be able to do that. I think the key in that is feeling really comfortable with the data. You know, not to a 105% category, but you know, closer to 80 or 85 percent, which it's not there yet. But I do think you'll have the information that you want to make those kind of decisions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Price? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, thank the uh, one of the consultants and uh, staff for their work efforts in, in, in bringing this in, uh, and this committee's efforts, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I too just want to make sure that uh, you know our area is not disadvantaged by whatever the rules of the eggs are that we, that we are developing. As I mentioned before, the report reflects that uh, District 9 has the second highest number of static off-site signs, and yet the, uh, the 713, uh, but the lowest number of digital signs at two in the city. And so um, see, I, I'm curious, when we talk about the separation distance <laughs> in, in that scenario, city-owned properties, Caltrans, highways, and scenic uh, highways. Uh, can you talk about how that impacts a district like mine where we've got the freeway running north and south, 110, and then the you know, portion running uh, east and west along the 10, uh, how that area is disadvantaged by, uh, by that? So our report model was based on the Plum Directive. So all the restrictions that were in the Plum Directive um, as well as some of the current sign codes. Um, so specifically, you pointed out highways. Uh, we use a 660-foot buffer consistent with Caltrans um, for public properties. We also did a separate scenario that modeled it without that 660-foot buffer, specifically for public properties. Um, but other than that, we applied a 2,000-foot buffer um, for private properties, and that's consistent with the current sign code. We also used a number of other buffers um, again, consistent with the Plum Directive, a 250-foot buffer for sign districts, um, existing sign districts, that is, um, and a 100-foot buffer for residential districts, or zones, sorry, um, and a 200-foot buffer for residential zones. So we tried to model a variety of different um, policies that the city may implement. Um, and again, uh, like my colleague was saying, we can model um, different restrictions, but we'll just need further refinements from the Plum Committee. If, if you were interested in knowing, well, what if I change the setbacks, right? right? And what if I change, we can do that quite easily. Um, so it, it isn't like we have to start all over. Right. It's a matter of we change the filters. Um, so if, if you wanted to say, what would be a reasonable policy variation for my district, because it looks and feels different, right? has different uh, infrastructure in it. Right. We can do that. Uh, well, I definitely want to do that, but to try to do a little deeper dive and, and, and to identify um, uh, issues.
issues that uh, could be affected. But in terms of, uh, as you looked around the, the, the country in, in case studies, did you come across these that had exemptions, certain exemptions uh, or hardship process for digital uh, off-site signage? So we, we found a couple things. So yes. Um, so there's a there's a lot of different structures and a lot of different um, policy implications. Some run afoul of various legal um, free speech things. There's a lot of lawsuits in the space. Um, but certain cities are very much trying to achieve certain policy objectives, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Toronto, all of which generate pretty significant revenues, have approaches that are very different than LA's currently. And so, you know, the answer is yes. We saw different ways of doing things for different reasons in different places, some of which have um, withstood legal challenges, some of which there are legal challenges. So I, I think there is not a one-size-fits-all. And even within a city, there are different um, tolerances or desires or objectives. And, it, and certainly in Chicago, it's very noteworthy that's been accommodated. Right? You have different structures for different areas. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bloomfield? Um, building on the question about the different restrictions for different areas or districts, uh, I was asking earlier about can you actually have districts that are excluded? And it seems if you could, if you can vary the setbacks and the different inputs, um, would you be prohibited from varying them in such a way that you make it virtually impossible to, to put a sign up? Or would that, would that pierce the uh, legality issue? So I'm, I'm eminently less qualified to answer a legal question than the city attorney. What, what we have found is um, different cities establish specific criteria for a certain area. And if you're not in that area, there's a different set of criteria. And so it's, it's well documented as to what the reasons are and what the policy objectives are. Um, Chicago, for example, it's a very concentrated area, very high traffic, going to be seen by a lot of people. And they said, we're good, pretty much. That's where we want it to be, and we don't want it to be other, in other places. That's been in existence for a while. Um, so, you know, with careful help from uh, the city attorney, I'm sure you can evaluate how can we do that? But, but it has to be a uniform policy citywide, or you can say this, this area is going to have these restrictions, and the adjacent area is going to have the opposite restrictions. I'm going to defer to the city attorney, but we've certainly seen where there's been different policies applied to different areas. OK, I will certainly want to understand that a little bit more. I also want to understand that this sort of baked in option of the, the council district, you said you would one scenario, or at least the way it's it's broken out on the chart, um, you, you bake in the this historical tolerance, um, or when the flip side of that is, I imagine we get sued about you know historical bias too. You know, if, if one district has been overly burdened and then we're baking that in, um, is that also not a risk of some sort, or is that do we have evidence that 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 works? Well, I, I mean, you have, I, I think the ratios in most of the sign districts are pretty well established with the, you know, exception of when the sports complex and LA Live sort of came into existence. Obviously, lots of new digital signs came into existence with them. But in most parts of the city, the, the ratios have been in effect for quite a while. And so I, I don't think that's a, you know, you're not discriminating against one part of the city against another. You have the way the ordinances work, some areas are more conducive than others. Um, so you have some you have some flexibility now. Well, you, you have flexibility, right? But we, but but what I understood this to mean is that you you sort of you're taking a snapshot of the the ratios, yes, and then you're applying them, maybe increasing them, but you're applying them forward. Um, we are. We're, we're saying, what if a district was happy with its its ratio in its sort of penetration level, and it wanted to continue it? So, you know, you would actually ha that would have to become, you know, part of the ordinance that would have to move forward. 
but we said, so if you were interested in that, what would it look like? Um, that, that's why it's there. And if you did that, though, then would that mean that all the takedowns in that, to, if you were to create a, a relocation agreement in that, under that scenario, does that limit all the takedowns have to be from that area in order to maintain that ratio? So you wouldn't be able to have cross-district takedowns? So we assumed in that scenario that you don't have cross-district takedowns. That was an assumption on our part. Um, because under the, under the sort of current draft, you do have, I think there's like a 50% in district and a 50% right. citywide, which does offer flexibility, especially districts that have had, have a lot more of the, the static ones to be able to, to have those taken down. But if it's, if it's a council district, if you lock in the ratio, then you're also, you're kind of firewalling uh, off. I think we're not proposing that that, you know, is, is the correct policy or the correct scenario, but that is in effect what it's trying to portray. If you, if you did want to stay, stay relative where you are, what would that look like? Because it does restrict the signs even further than the takedown ratio would. That's exactly what it does. You still have a takedown ratio, but you, you're, you're, but you, but you're you apply compliant. that rate, that percentage to it, right? So if you're 45% of District 14, whatever the takedown ratio is, it's going to be 45% of that. So it, it definitely, it was designed to show what happens if you're more restrictive. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, any other questions here? No? Okay. Is building and safety here? Okay. Can we ask you to come up, please? And thank you for the report. Look forward to continue to work with you. I, I, ha I actually have a question for you, but I'm, I'm wondering as well, do you have a, any additional reporting to make on this? <coughs> yeah, yes, I do, Councilman. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Council Members. Frank Lara, representing Department of Building and Safety. Go, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. As directed by this committee, Department has support, submitted a report back to committee which provides a strategy to secure immediate funding for two additional inspection staff as part of the offsite sign periodic inspection program and which would be independent of any expanded fee program that might be as, ex, associated with the proposed sign ordinance. The department has worked with the Office of City Administrative Officer and supports the recommendation that unfunded resolution authorities on two building mechanical inspectors would be fully funded through existing fees. The department concurs that the cost could be offset through the collection of code violation inspection fees and non-compliance fees, which are typically assessed on department orders to obtain compliance. Therefore, we recommend that in order to secure immediate funding for these positions that the council, subject to the approval of the mayor, authorized by resolution the two positions within LADBS to provide additional sign enforcement. The department has also included in the report our concerns with implementation of proposed civil administrative penalties. The proposed provision states in part that the assessment of civil penalties established in this section shall replace any other administrative or judicial remedies established by this code to address violations of the sign regulations. Although the department supports the application of administrative civil penalties, we have serious concerns that if certain provisions are passed as they are, those provisions will diminish department efficiency and effectiveness in sign enforcement. One concern is that the proposed language would create an unnecessary adversarial relationship with on-site sign owners that may complicate and lengthen the compliance process. This proposed provision requires that civil administrative penalties be imposed for all sign violations from the smallest on-site business sign to the largest off-site billboard. Presently, the vast majority of sign enforcement is conducted on on-site signs. Our current enforcement procedure of issuing orders to comply and assisting sign owners to remedy these violations has been extremely effective to resolve most of these cases. Whenever an on-site sign owner is resistant to the enforcement process, the city attorney has been very effective in obtaining compliance through a hearing process or subsequent criminal court action. 
LADBS contends that applying civil administrative penalties for enforcement of on-site sign violations is unnecessary and excessive. A second concern is with the 16-day interval prior to the assessment of the penalties. <coughs> the proposed provision for the assessment of those penalties indicates that penalties will begin to accrue on the 16th day after the effective date shown on the order to comply. LADBS contends that this interval is too short for sign enforcement. The 16-day interval will replace current LADBS enforcement procedure and timelines, which have been proven to provide effective results and reasonable due process when escalation of cases has resulted in litigation or criminal filings. The department asserts that a premature assessment of penalties will be counterproductive to sign enforcement. <coughs> a third concern is that staff time and other costs related to collection of penalties will become overly burdensome. Based on many years of code enforcement experience, the department warns that collection of these new penalties <coughs> is likely to become a challenging undertaking. LADBS has experienced that a significant number of fee assessments have required enhanced collection efforts, which include lien processing. Collection of penalties on the large number of on-site violations will become burdensome in terms of city staff and other costs associated with collection activities. Our remaining concern is that the appeal provisions in section 14427 are logistically challenging and inconsistent with existing appeal procedures. The proposed appeal provisions in this section are likely to be viewed as a favorable action as many sign violators uh, due to the provision to temporary stay the approval of, of penalties. The significant number of potential appeals and the logistically challenging proposed pro procedure to process those appeals will place unreasonable demands on city staff. These proposed provisions should be amended to parallel existing efficient administrative appeal provisions in other parts of the municipal code. These stated concerns provide the basis for the department to recommend that the committee instruct the Department of City Planning, Department of Building and Safety, and the City Attorney to jointly report back with amended provisions for civil administrative penalties to be ex applied exclusively to off-site sign violations, that the time interval preceding the commencement of penalties be amended to allow for LADBS to exhaust normal enforcement procedure, and that the appeal provisions in section 14427 be amended to be consistent with other existing appeal uh, procedures in the municipal code. So, council members, I'm prepared for questions. Okay, great, thank you. Actually, my question was answered there. Any questions, Mr. Blumenfeld? Yeah, um, in, your, in your opinion, how much gaming of the system occurs with the on-site signage covertly being used for off-site advertising? And could this be exacerbated by the sort of generous allocations for on-site digital? And uh, what options do we have for curtailing this kind of behavior or limiting the, the on-site digital? Uh, currently, uh, the department has recognized there's a, a certain amount of abuse out there um, with uh, certain operators taking out permits for on-site signs, putting on off-site messages, um, you know, using taglines to say that they're on-site signs and this kind of thing. So um, that does exist out there. Um, of course, uh, if you make on-site signs uh, you know, more um, um, lucrative by allowing, for instance, digital to be changing images more frequently, um, you know, that might intensify that occurrence. So, um, you know, al although in, in the report I did state that the um, that we want the administrative penalties uh, applied to offsite signs, but perhaps applying them also to digital signs, the new provisions for digital signs might work to to take care of that problem. There were something. I mean, uh, perhaps. I mean, even if you're 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 per going for the the civil stuff is unnecessary. Maybe for violations, sort of the typical on-site size too small to, you know, something more of an innocent nature versus um, using, falsely using an on-site for an off-site. Maybe, I mean, I guess I would ask you to consider that or if we do move forward with something, having that as a, uh, having a bigger hammer for that. Um, well, because I understand your concern about being overwhelmed with sort of the, the small administrative on-site issues that probably happen all the time someone's signs to this or to that, but if, they're, if you're using it to circumvent our whole system, we ought to have a big hammer, is the way yes. I look at it. Yes, you, I understand. Now that, uh, uh, perhaps those administrative penalties, uh, like I say, the potential maybe for the digital signage on the on-site you 
know, could, could enhance. Or, or initially, um, the on-site signage is limited by those time, place, and manners, which, you know, limit the size of the sign. And, uh, and it is, although there are a number of um, abuses, you know, they're, it, based on the number of total signage in the city, they're not extreme. But with digital signs, I could see how that could proliferate. And, and the new, I mean, the new systems could certainly exacerbate that. Yes. Okay. And and how are we addressing the offsite signage that that currently don't have the valid permits? Currently, um, well, we have we have to be careful. There's um, uh, the signage. We we have to proceed following the California Business Professionals Professions Code. Um, you know, lawfully erect, erected and. Uh, rebuttable presumption, um, many of those signs, for instance, signs that, uh, billboards that exist that we have no permit record on, um, it's, it's very difficult to rebut that presumption. Uh, it requires a large amount of uh, historical permit record research. Uh, it also requires historic code research, um, you know, not only of the, of the sign and the property itself, but other adjacent properties to see uh, if spacing requirements have been met, and then try to, and then also try to um, get some kind of evidence of when that sign was installed, because that's uh, important to rebut the presumption. So, so. Is, is there something that, that you all need to help make that happen better? More staff would assist with that, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. All righty, so now we'll go to public comment. Barbara Broidy from the West Side Neighborhood Council. All speakers have one minute, but the uh, Neighborhood Council with the CAS on file is three minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Huizar. My name is Barbara Broidy. I'm a member of the West Side Neighborhood Council. We passed a motion many, many, many months ago saying that we were completely opposed to the relighting of any of the digital signs, the relocation of digital signs that were deemed illegal by the courts, period. That is it. Um, this meeting today is a secret to most people. I realize it was legally posted, but the reports came out late last week. There isn't a single neighborhood council in this city that could read, not even at don't even talk about analyzing, who could read those reports, call a plum meeting, and or a board meeting to consider it. So, and it is the holidays, by the way. So we need to have a minimum of 60 days notice for important matters such as this. We are charged with advising the city, mm -hmm. and we can't do our job if we don't have appropriate notice. So we need this issue to be opened up. We need those consultants to come to plan check or other meetings to talk about their report and their findings so that we may intelligently advise this board. The communities have come out in great support of a strong and balanced sign ordinance. And we have been supportive of the 2002 sign ban, which is our current sign ordinance. However, we recognized way back when, when the city revisited this issue, that there would need to be some give for more signage in the city. And sign districts were deemed to be the most legally defensible and reasonable manner to do that. This committee has been whittling down that proposal and reasonable takedown mechanisms for months and years. And the community doesn't stand there. Your, uh, your conclusion at one of the recent meetings, which was filled with shill people from the sign business and their friends, said that there is a pent-up demand for digital signs. We would contest that. People are not clamoring for digital signs in their neighborhood. And the assumption that you can take some old crappy signs down that are sitting in a district and replace them with some nice digital signs, the impact of those static signs compared to the impact of digital signs is a different world. Ask Mayor Garcetti about how suddenly Eagle Rock and Silver Lake woke up when they got their first digital sign. I can tell you what it's like, because we had one intersection two blocks from my house where there were three digital signs at one intersection. And you never talk about driver distraction and pedestrian and bicycle safety with these signs. Where is that discussion? You talk about money you can get. What happens when the first cyclist is killed by a distracted driver who's watching the digital sign? We know they're designed to distract, and we know they're supposed to catch the eyes of drivers. That's their purpose. So lots of issues to discuss. We need more time to do it. Uh, the takedown of two to one is completely unacceptable. 
Uh, and litigation. We're worried that what you're looking at cannot be legally defended. This city has a huge and sordid past with litigation. Okay. Thank you. And yes, on, on timing, we've been waiting for these reports for some time, and we finally got them, so we wanted to put them out to the public to digest, understand them. We will be back again um, after the new year, uh, so that's uh, some time for people for these reports to be out in the public. Thank you. Richard Biker, Spacer, from Los Feliz Neighborhood Council. Welcome. Thank you very much, members of the committee. Three minutes, right, you have a CIS on file. Thank you, Correct. welcome. The community impact statement on file, I will read that. Um, this group was, the uh, CIS will say Greater Griffith Park Neighborhood Council, that was the previous name. Um, what I wasn't hearing today before I start is what are some of the downsides, the distraction by these signs. It was quite clear that it was wanting to have more and more signs in more and more places. So I'd raise the concern about distraction and accidents, not just on bicycles, but on cars and pedestrians. That really needs to be addressed. Greater Griffith Park, this light is not great. Uh, and I have copies for everyone. I understand you have a staff person here who can take those. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Can you distribute them, please? Our sergeant at arms will get those from you. Thank you. This board uh, supports um, an immediate interim ban. We appreciate that's been going on. Um, doggone it. A prompt uh, approval of I'll try to summarize the points. There needs to be a sign unit. It needs to have representation from um, building and safety, from planning, from the city attorney and other expertise that's mentioned. Any proposed digital billboard, I have not heard this in any of the statements so far, must go to the neighborhood groups, the councils, the resident associations, and as the previous, previous speaker said, a minimum of 60 days to look at it and to get the feedback to this committee and to the city council. We uh, do need to have a sense of the schedule. You've given some suggestion for that. I will wrap up my comments with that at this time. Uh, I would like a little better light. Thank you very much. Thank you. Armando Flores, Olivia Lee, Ron Miller. Good afternoon, my name is Armando Flores with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. We represent more than 400 businesses and nonprofits in the San Fernando Valley and all across the LA region. Uh, the LA sign reduction ordinance before you is strong and it is time to move it forward. The ordinance will provide a mechanism for small businesses to advertise their products, drive customers to their locations, and grow their business, creating more jobs and stimulating the local economy. It will provide the city with revenue for critical services, including police and fire, and sidewalk or road improvements. Uh, but most importantly, the proposal will allow communities to determine their digital footprint. Uh, the time to create opportunities for digital advertising is now. It is time to create opportunities that allow small businesses to thrive. We ask that you take action to move an ordinance forward for both private and public property 
for off-site signs in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Olivia Lee with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are here to support a comprehensive sign reduction ordinance that will reduce the total number of traditional signs in exchange for a limited number of digital signs. Uh, billboards are a vital part of LA's economy, allowing businesses to advertise and grow their companies while bringing revenue into the region. This issue has been looked at for a very long time. We must implement basic rules that streamline the use of billboards. They're a benefit to the public and we must do it soon. As you know, this ordinance will simply allow for a process for digital signs to be considered in the city of LA, not ones that will be approved as a result of this process. It's time we let individual communities decide what's best for their own neighborhoods. So we ask that please move this ordinance forward as it will provide additional revenue for local projects, increase notification resources for public safety, and help create jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Miller, I'm not here. Cindy Starrett. Benjamin Hanelin, James Carpenter, Roy Flahive, Flahive. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, <coughs> council members. Happy holidays to all of you. I'm Cindy Starrett from Latham and Watkins here for Clear Channel Outdoor. We're encouraged by the progress and the reports before you today, but there are important issues as you've been discussing. These include the environmental review, the staff found prior versions of this ordinance to be exempt from CEQA, and this one also merits categorical exemptions. This is a framework. It doesn't approve any new signs, and in fact, it includes regulatory requirements to ensure the protection of the environment, which is another categorical exemption. That is the way the city treats procedural ordinances like this, and this ordinance should have a categorical exemption. With respect, we do not agree with the discussion earlier about the discretion the council has. You have discretion under state law. These are relocation agreements under section 6413, and they are voluntary. They are entered into on whatever terms are agreeable to the government and the property owner or the sign applicant. That is the authority you're acting under, and you have full discretion to exercise that. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable council members, Benjamin Hanelin of Latham and Watkins also on behalf of Clear Channel Outdoor. We appreciate that the Navigant study confirms the key role of relocation agreements in reducing the number of existing billboards and that many other cities use this important tool. However, the study's revenue estimates regarding a public property only option are flawed. The, the study merely plots dots on a map to create the false impression that public property alone would allow for significant sign reduction in revenue generation. No support is provided to show that any of these locations are commercially viable. And at the end of the day, that's really the only test that matters. Is the location commercially viable for a sign? Additionally, it ignores the fact that sites <coughs> owned by other entities such as Metro would keep a large portion of the revenue for their own benefit. Consistent with the planning department's draft ordinance, the city should move forward with a comprehensive approach, including both private and pu public property that will maximize the opportunity for sign reduction and revenue for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next is, welcome. Hello, James Carpentier with uh, here on behalf of the California Sign Association and the International Sign Association. And I'm here to um, thank staff and the Plump Committee for all the hard work because we understand how much work it takes to get this done. And, um, we're here to uh, just indicate strong support for the on-premise sign digital portion of the code. We think it protects uh, communities throughout the community and throughout the city. And one of those main protections is um, there's a recorded deed restriction that is placed on each property that uh, requires compliance with the on and off messaging, which was talked about before, which is one of, although I would consider it the strongest regulation of that type of any place I've seen anywhere in the country. So I just wanted to mention that. And with that, I just uh, respectfully request your support of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Roy, Patrick Frank, Barbara Utes, Marion Dodge. Welcome. Good evening, Roy Flayhive. I'm the executive director of the California Sign Association. We represent your on-site sign industry in the state of California, and we have since 1959. We're here to give our strong support to the revised proposed code put forward by the planning department, the 
especially in regards to the on-site digital. We want to thank the planning department for their hard work on that very important section of the code. We want to thank the Plum Committee for having this on your agenda and helping to move this eight-year discussion forward. We are in agreement with Building and Safety and they're concerned about the penalties and the administration of those penalties included in this. Believe they should be revisited. We work with uh, government entities throughout the state of California and be willing to be a reference source for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Patrick Frank. I'm the president of the coalition to ban billboard blight and I would like to talk about the proposed legislation. Um, it, we, we define billboard blight as digital signs outside of sign districts. And, and I can see that the proposed legislation envisions a reduction in the total number of signs, but this comes at a very high price in terms of the addition of hundreds, literally hundreds of new digital signs. The proposed bill has these relocation agreements which are very permissive. They're very loose and they allow off-site and on-site signs. On-site signs were not a part of the original Planning Commission report, so this is a novelty that we're not quite ready to adjust to yet. The, the, the re relocation agreements seem to allow a digital sign on nearly any lot with the, with the word commercial in its designation. If that doesn't define billboard blight, I don't know what does. Digital signs need to be closely regulated because of aesthetic, environmental, and traffic concerns. What we're proposing there is not regulation in that legislation, but rather capitulation. Thank you. Barbara? I'm Marion Dodge. I'm speaking on behalf of the Hillside Federation, the Los Feliz Improvement Association, and Friends of Griffith Park. We support the City Planning Commission's recommendations of October 22, 2015. We oppose any and all efforts to allow digital billboards outside of sign districts. We particularly oppose any attempt to permit billboards on city property, especially in city parks. You can regulate content on public property. Section 1584 prohibits off-site signs in state and national parks, but not from city parks, likewise on-site signs. The buffer around sensitive areas used to be 500 feet. It's now a mere 100 feet. The new relocation policy and on-site sign policy is a pure giveaway to the sign industry. The only ones who are going to make a lot of money off of billboards are the sign industry. So many changes have been made that the ordinance should go back to the CPC for further review. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Recht. Miriam Valencia, Piedmont Brown, Victor De La Cruz, Rabbi Jonathan Klein. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Phil Recht representing uh, Summit Media. As the Navigant report points out, three companies own and operate 95% of the signs in this city. For those companies, each of which, ha each of which has 2,000 or more signs, taking down eight signs for one digital or instead paying $250,000 annual in lieu fees for lower takedowns is really not difficult. For small companies like Summit, which has 60 signs, those requirements are impossible. Um, we simply don't have the inventory uh, and $250,000 a sign uh, takes out all the profit and, and more, makes it impossible to participate. So once again, uh, we urge this committee that if you're going to adopt a digital sign program to please come up with reasonable and feasible criteria to allow small operators to participate. If not, you're simply going to restore to the big companies the same improper monopoly they had in the now infamous settlement agreement era. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mary Valencia on behalf of Outfront Media. Thank you, Councilman Quizar and committee for moving this forward. We respectfully request the city provide a predictable applicant-funded permit processing system to ensure reasonable rules on digital permit submittals. There should be a monthly cap per applicant and deadline for the submission of applications for relocation agreements. This is necessary to allow city departments adequate time to process applications. It also helps to ensure fairness among applicants in a competitive process where spacing constraints could favor early applicants. The city will need neutral procedures for resolving spacing conflicts among applications submitted in the same monthly cycle. 
We respectfully request that the ordinance include express provisions addressing the timing issue and a mechanism for fairly resolving spacing issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Piedmont Brown out here. Okay. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Rabbi Jonathan Klein with CLU, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. So at this point uh, in the current struggle at the national level, the tax plan is looking like it will put certain funding that we thought would come to the city in jeopardy around affordable housing and whatnot. We know that the city is always struggling to find income streams, and here we have an opportunity to actually see money come to the general fund and to other parts of this government to make sure that this city operate in a functional fashion. Uh, for years, we've been waiting for this to move forward, and we believe it really is time uh, for this to move forward. I also want to point out the public versus private. Back in the day of the cell towers being brought in, uh, a lot of nonprofits benefited because it was allowed to be put on private sites. We want to make sure that churches and other institutions of nonprofits are able to have that benefit as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, Victor Dela Cruz with Manat Phelps and Phillips on behalf of Regency Outdoor Advertising. We'd like to thank staff for the much improved draft ordinance, in particular the new relocation provisions, which we believe are critical for the sign industry's need to modernize its inventory and the city's equally important goal of reducing the total amount of billboards across the city. As you begin to formulate the amount of the public benefit payment and drill down on takedown ratios, we can't stress enough how important it is for the various companies to inform this process and to have a seat at the table. Although Regency stands ready to take sounds, signs down, it has fewer billboards to take down and will be, will be more focused on the public benefit payment. It also does not have the smaller poster billboards that are not valuable in the slightest and easy to remove. And unlike its competitors, Regency did not reap any windfalls from erecting digital billboards pursuant to its settlement agreement with the city. These differences matter and must be considered so that we end up with a policy that is fair. In that light, we look forward to engaging with staff and discussing this matter with you all in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stacy Miller, Ray Baker, Margarita Amador. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Committee members. My name is Stacy Miller, and I represent the LA, LA Outdoor Advertising uh, Coalition. We're comprised of Lamar Advertising, Outfront Media, and Clear Channel Outdoor. We have been and continue to be supportive of a billboard reduction plan that will allow the removal of almost 4,000 billboards in the city of LA, provide significant revenue to the city, provide community benefits for underserved area, and provide emergency messaging that so many of us need at this critical time. We would also respect, uh, respectfully ask that you clarify three issues that we believe were not addressed or need clarification in the current draft. Tolling and penalties, which would allow for responsible sign companies the legal grounds to challenge a mistaken or improper compliance order. Number two, the run to the counter provision, which would provide protections for your staff and create a level playing field for sign companies. And three, rebuttable presumption, which follows state law regarding the existing the issue of existing non-conforming signs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, my name is Ray Baker with Lamar Advertising. As Stacy had pointed out, I'm here to talk a little more about tolling. Uh, we are a member of the LA Advertising Coalition, uh, which has been working collectively on this ordinance for about 10 years. Uh, our coalition supports aggressive enforcement against illegal signs as illegal signage hurts legitimate companies in our industry. Um, that being said, responsible sign companies and sign owners should have reasonable legal grounds to challenge a mistaken or improper compliance order. Um, as Mr. Lara spoke to, rebuttable presumption does factor in on that. Um, any such sign should provide that no penalties be accrued during administrative and judicial review known as tolling, which would also be covered under the 14th Amendment. Uh, the proposed ordinance maintains the intent in prior drafts to toll penalties during the administrative process. However, it is unclear whether penalties are tolled if the administrative hearing officer's determination is appealed under the proposed section. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Margarita Amador, Derek Ryder, Wade Trimmer, Nancy Hoffman, Vanette. Good afternoon. I would like to request uh, under uh, special accommodation under the American with Disabilities Act due to my dyslexia in order to be able to read my statement, if that's possible. Sure. Um, An extra minute, just so that uh, I am able uh, One to second, please. Uh, and and uh, go back to one minute, please. One second. I, this is the first time I encounter this, but we will accommodate this, and uh, I think we'd have to revisit this as well in the future with our um, city attorney and, and staff to go ahead, ahead. I think it's a good idea just to let her have the extra time now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Two minutes, please. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, good afternoon. My name is Margarita Amador, and I'm a resident of uh, CD14, Boyle Heights. Uh, I grew up in Picualiso, Liso Village. Uh, I've been there all my life. Um, I'm also very active in my community through, I've been involved in my neighborhood council, the community police advisory about the Hollenbeck, and also I've been, um, you know, involved at my park. Um, as you heard today, uh, council district has the most billboards. That's disturbing. Uh, I'm here to express my support for the proposed updates to Los Angeles sign ordinance so that we can finally see some relief after so many years. Give us a chance to remove thousands of billboards and receive much needed revenue for our city in exchange for a few digital billboards. On behalf of my community, I strongly encourage you to move ahead with this ordinance on both private and public property so all of Los Angeles can have a greater control when it comes to billboards in our neighborhoods it's time for all of us to benefit. There's no reason to wait. Um, I think this ordinance is going to really help, especially our community, in bringing um, resources that we lack um, because there's a disparis disparity in services um, that we don't have, that people in the West Side have. And obviously, because we have a lot of billboards, we have the most and people in the west side. I think um, it's extremely important for this ordinance to move forward um, so that you know our community can continue to preserve its rich, historic, and beautiful um, community that we are known for. Um, um, and I invite you to come see the horrific blight of billboards that we have. So thank you again for accommodating me. Thank you. Derek Ryder. Wade Trimmer, Nancy Hoffman, Vignette. Good, after, good afternoon, council members. Derek Ryder, resident of Mount Washington. As our elected representatives, you know you represent us and not corporations. Unfortunately, if you pass the draft site ordinance as amended, you will be sending the message that you favor the billboard companies over us, uh, your constituents. As constituents, neighborhood councils, and regular people, we've made the case again and again um, that the, these amendments will provide toothless regulations which will sanction the illegal billboards and add new, larger, intrusive digital signs to our public space. But if you side with the billboard companies, you will do more damage than shoving more signage into our children's faces. You will be uh, confirming the appearance and reality that Plum and City Hall is on sale to the highest bidder. As architect and advocate of urban housing, I'm often challenged by my neighbors who are anti-development because they distrust City Hall. This distrust of you elected officials is hard to um, overcome when you pass ordinances like the current draft and City Hall appears to be in the pocket of billboard companies rather than serving the people's interests. By passing this draft, you will be causing damage not only to our public space but to the credibility of City Council as a democratic body able to provide leadership on tough issues. Great. Thank you very much. Sir, can I ask you a question? Sir? Yes. Um, and thank you. I mean, it's, it's my job as chair to put out everything that's available. We're putting out various options. And so we're going to put out all those options and come back and decide. But let me ask you this. A district like mine that's been dumped on, and we have thousands of billboards, many of them that are not even registered with the city, and this has been happening for decades. I mean, we have to have a mechanism so that we take some of those down because we've been dumped on with billboards. And so I think there's various perspectives on this conversation. If you have some ideas on how we could move forward to take down some of those billboards in, co in communities throughout the city that have been dumped on, we're welcome and open to them. 
because if we do try to take them down, even now, even though they put them up probably illegally, it's very difficult for us now to go take them down. So we're open to any ideas, and we obviously do not want to put that burden on other communities, but there's various things out here. Uh, we ask those who have the same perspective to please come up with ideas on how we could have more balance on this. Okay. Yeah, if you have working sessions that I could contribute to, I'd be happy to be okay. part of that. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Wade Trimmer, the executive director of the San Fernando Valley Rescue Mission. Uh, each year, our organiz organization provides almost 50,000 meals, over 10,500 showers through our mobile shower program, and almost 10,000 nights of shelter for women, men, and children in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, we rely on outdoor billboard advertisement to reach our clients, as many of them don't have access to the means uh, of, of traditional uh, and traditional methods of advertising. Um, these billboards are often our clients' only lifeline to a nutritious and warm meal, uh, sh a shower and clean clothes, uh, and a safe and warm place to sleep. And with half of our guests being under the age of 12 in our shelter, uh, you might imagine what runs through the mind of a homeless parent when they look up at a billboard and realize that they have access to a safe and warm place for their children. Uh, I ask that you move forward with the policy for the good of our homeless families and for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Hoffman Vanyet. Hi, I'm Nancy Hoffman Vanyek. I'm the CEO of the Greater San Fernando Valley Chamber of Commerce. And we are in support of the comprehensive site ordinance. You know, um, 46 states have enacted comprehensive site ordinances allowing for the reasonable and responsible use of digital and traditional signs. And we need to also have the ability to join them where we have the ability to take them down and put them up in a reasonable manner. Uh, billboards provide an alternative means of advertising and provide business exposure and brand recognition to audiences on the move. And I'm sure we're all familiar. You go online. I was looking at Macy's while I was sitting here and immediately other places popped up with the things I was looking for. These impressions are short, but that's what consumers are looking for today. And my chamber members are looking for quick ways to reach their customers. So we look to you to approve the sign ordinance that has come before you. Thank you. That uh, concludes public comment. Any other questions from our staff? I mean, from our committee members? No? Okay. That's a report pack request before we Sure, start. Mr. Um, you are disrupting this meeting, sir. If you have any concerns, please speak to the uh, sergeant at arms. The sergeant at arms will relay that message to me. Sir, you come to every meeting, you know the rules. If you disrupt this one more time, we're going to ask you to leave again. Okay, you're, asked, you're being asked to leave right now. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, we will continue this meeting. Uh, any questions? Any uh, questions, Mr. Blumenfield? I have some requests for some report backs, but... Mr. Chair, oh, yes. uh, Mr. Herman continues to disrupt the meeting at the top of his lungs, shouting racial epithets and refusing to be silent even for two seconds as he leaves the room. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, City Attorney, let it note for the record that this individual has been asked to leave at numerous planning meetings and uh, I know there are certain rules about how we can bar individuals from not coming to meetings. Uh, I am beginning to feel threatened uh, by this individual after meetings when I walk through the hallways. Uh, he comes at me with a very imposing posture. Uh, I am seeking the city attorney's advice to ban this individual from um, plum meetings and possibly council meetings. Yes, we'll, we'll, we will look at it. Thank you that. very much. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. If it's appropriate timing, I have some requests for report backs on some of the things we've talked about. Is it sure. Okay to do yes. That now? Okay. So, um, as part of this discussion, it's been a very good discussion from my perspective. I wanted to get some report backs. One on the opt in requirements for relocation agreements based on specific geographies, such as community plan areas or council districts, including information on what criteria could be used for the opt in if any. We talked about that before, but I wanted to formalize that as, as a report back. 
also a report back on how recent uh, and historic litigation could help inform the draft of, of this ordinance, uh, including the legality of not having findings in the discretionary process. Um, some of the, the speakers spoke to that issue and, and were, were saying that we had more discretion and there's been less to, and, and the presentation was also telling me that we have, we have to create these findings. So to get a, a report back on the legality of, of how far we can uh, go on the, on the discretionary aspect would be very helpful. Uh, a report back on the examples of other local California cities, the use of the uh, private and public relocation agreement, um, examples of other digital signage in the public right of way as a report back, and a report back on, on how a public only relocation agreement process would work, the RFP process, the criteria the council could consider in implementing the initiative, as well as a timeline if this was done uh, as a pilot program with needed takedown requirements, uh, benefits, and lease options. Uh, so with those, those are the, the ones I'd like to see report back on. Great. Thank you very much. Anything else? Well, thank you. And again, I want to thank our staff for the significant pro progress that we've made uh, to this point. I realize that the entire city family has been working and racing to get us to this point. And what we've been asking for is data, data for us to make our decisions. And I think we're moving in that direction, whatever that may be. Uh, but I do want to remind ourselves about the intent of us to craft a balanced piece of legislation that centers on blight reduction of the over 8,000 existing signs in the city, uh, neighborhood protections through robust zoning regulations, and strengthening our enforcement capacity, and also possibly um, appropriating community benefits from any new legislation. Uh, but with that, I do understand that uh, we have uh, some work to do on the data that it had been gathered. Um, so I'm asking that we uh, pursue uh, refining the reports we got back um, in that respect. So in addition to the report backs that we, uh, Mr. Bloomfield had asked for, I moved to instruct the CLA to re report back in 60 days with an amended financial study that better takes into account neighborhood protections and physical site constraints, namely to filter out properties that would not be appropriate sites for billboard relocation, such as DWP facilities, LAPD, and fire department stations, LA River properties, and any other property not consistent with our policy goals. I also move to instruct planning to report back in 60 days with a draft billboard blight reduction policy guidance document. And um, we'll move in that direction, hopefully come back early 2018 to hear this again. In the meantime, the public will have time to uh, digest the reports that were put out in the last few days. Thank you. Anything else? So ordered. Thank you. Mr. Mejia, where does that leave us? Have you done public comment, Councilman? No, 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 we haven't done public comment. Patricia McAllister. Herman, who has been asked to leave. Okay. That concludes this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>